Morning, everyone. Can you hear me if you want to? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Fenn. I'm joined by my colleague Ken Sealing, and uh, we have been appointed as the special advisors to the Honorable Steve Clark, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, to provide recommendations as part of the Regional Government Review. So welcome uh, to you today, both to people making uh, presentations and to those who are attending to hear what the presenters say. Um, the purpose of the Regional Government Review is to examine governance, decision making, and service delivery functions in eight regional municipalities and the county of Simcoe. And that represents uh, 82 municipalities in toll. Um, we're to identify opportunities to ensure that these municipalities are working effectively and efficiently and uh, ways in which they can continue to provide the vital services on which all of our communities depend. Our role as special advisors is to provide the government with recommendations on how to achieve uh, these objectives. Uh, we, once we deliver our recommendations to government, uh, the government itself, of course, will determine what next steps will be. Uh, we anticipate a report going into the government in the early part of July, and um, there may be some status reported out at the Association of Municipalities Conference uh, later in the summer, but uh, our report is to the minister, and then and the government will decide uh, what public information is made available uh, after that. Um, the meetings today are an opportunity both for individuals and for organizations that live, work, and do business in our municipalities to um, uh, give us direct feedback. Um, we're particularly interested in ideas, uh, ideas for improvement in the three areas that I identified, as well as areas for cost reduction or things that we should be looking at uh, with, uh, with an eye to the future. The input that we received today and the, through the broader uh, consultation process that includes an online survey and, a, and opportunities to provide uh, written submissions will in combination inform, inform our deliberations. Uh, so far we've had something approaching 6,000 submissions to the online uh, portal and uh, we are um, working our way through those. Uh, and in addition to that, this is the ninth of nine public meetings that we've held around the province to solicit public input on these, uh, these topics. Um, we have um, a format that uh, provides individuals with five minutes to make their presentation and organizations uh, are being given 10 minutes to make their um, submission. Uh, we'll let you know when you've reached uh, towards the end of your presentation and uh, um, uh, the, uh, your allotted time. Uh, we may at that point have some questions for you. Um, we should point out that uh, the questions we're posing are really to better understand what you've said and to probe some of your uh, points. Uh, we may even ask uh, questions that are more provocative uh, on the basis of finding out uh, what, you, what you think in, in more specific terms. You shouldn't interpret that as being indicative of any particular conclusions we've drawn or directions we're going to follow. It's a little early for that, but uh, we, um, we may probe uh, some of the things that are being suggested. Uh, if you wish to provide a copy of your presentation or any other material that you think we should consider, uh, please deliver it to the ministry staff who are supporting us off to my uh, left with their hands raised. Thank you. And uh, um, we will have a look at, at those at that time. If you have any additional information that you'd like to provide but you don't happen to have it with you today or you think you want to follow up based on what people have said today, uh, you can submit it any time before uh, the 21st of May, as is the deadline for the closing of the web portal that is uh, uh, taking public submissions and um, uh, the uh, results to the question, or the taking submissions on the questionnaire as well. Um, uh, that web portal also provides you information on how to make your presentation, and it can be found at uh, ontario.ca, oblique stroke regional government. Um, As part of the uh, presentations, uh, this pur the purpose of this exercise is to hear from you, so we're not going to be taking questions to us. We're interested in what you have to say, and uh, so um, we would ask you to um, uh, respect the presentations that are being made and, uh, and uh, allow them the, the courtesy of, um, of uh, making their presentations without interruption. 
I don't know whether there's anything further to say, so uh, with that uh, uh, introduction, uh, we will go to our list of pre-registered uh, delegations. The first uh, presentation we have registered is Mr. Rick Snydel, who represents uh, the We Love Oakville Stop Amalgamation Group, and you will have, if you would come forward, introduce yourself and uh, to, the, uh, to the assembly, and you will have 10 minutes starting now. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Rick Snydel. I'm with the relatively new organization called We Love Oakville. And I'd like to welcome Mr. Fenn and Mr. Sealing to this beautiful sunny day in Oakville, the heart of Halton, where, as you mentioned, the ninth of nine presentations. So uh, I can imagine what that's been like, and I hope we saved the best for last. You did. It's been yes. fun. <laughs> uh, just to explain a little bit, We Love Oakville is a new g gathering of people a grassroots organization. Our board consists of represent representatives from the nine residents association in Oakville and three business uh, business in industry advisors, uh, downtown PIA association. Um, we're a grassroots organization. We've done some funding with GoFundMe and through various social medias. Just an overview today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our position with respect to amalgamation, restructuring, the organization. Uh, we'll have separate presentations from different residents associations about councils and governance, service delivery and efficiency, and citizen engagement. And then a little summary and wrap of, of our position. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I started with our residents association working with a colleague on a review of finances and budgeting process in Oakville and in Halton, uh, which was uh, quite fascinating and kind of set me up for this position I'm in right now. Um, within the Residents Association, our concerns about the communities and how they might be impacted by any potential reorganization structuring uh, kind of moved on to economic concerns. And to get a background, we kind of looked at the history of the amalgamation that has happened uh, within Halton with respect to the structuring now of the four municipalities and the region of Halton. Uh, I mentioned the financial review we've done. We've also spoken with our local and regional councillors and with our MPPs. Specifically with respect to research, I'd like to refer you to three documents you're probably quite familiar with. The 2015 Fraser Institute study on municipal amalgamations, the 2016 C.D. Howe report uh, on improving service and delivery. And in both of those, the principal was a guy named Zachary Spicer. Uh, and then more recently, in 2019, the consulting firm of Deloitte did a specific, specific study of financial impacts on potential service delivery models in the region of Peel, which we find quite germane to what we're looking at today. And we also listened to residents, comments in social media, meetings of Residents Association and PIAs. Our concerns, uh, which we'd like to present today, is your process is covering a large, large geographic area, nine different regions, very wide divergences, divergences in the size and structure and issues affecting those regions, and you've been given a very limited time frame to do that, which I admire you for in terms of the scope of your, your project here. Uh, in Halton, we don't think as part of an analysis of nine disparate regions, there can be one solution or a recommendation for nine different regions, but we certainly would be very interested in recommendations for Halton of any kind that you come, have come up with in your study. Uh, by way of comment, uh, Halton and Oakville specifically have very high satisfactions uh, recorded and surveyed by both Halton and Oakville. Uh, our research, and I mentioned the sources for our research, uh, indicate that there are very high potential risks for amalgamation or restructuring with potentials uh, not to find efficiencies and in the past to have raised tax levels, raised debt, and perhaps diminished service levels and quality. Certainly citizens groups will talk about the concerns about loss of community control and contact with elected officials. Uh, we think our two-tier structure that we have currently, which has approximately a 52-48% split of the uh, funding 52% to the region and 48% to Oakville in our particular circumstance indicates that we have looked at services such as the police, such as water, such as waste that are most effectively covered in an amalgamated basis and the ones best left within the municipality. So our proposal this morning is that the current structure is substantially appropriate and effective. There are always rooms for improvement. 
Our residents do not appear to want changes from the discussions we've had, and certainly they don't want arbitrary changes imposed. Uh, the markets rep recognize Oakland and Halton with AAA ratings as financially responsible. I mentioned the surveys of, in particular, Oakville in 2019, which will be discussed later, which gave very high satisfaction with both elected representatives and with service delivery. And our review, which I conducted with a colleague, where we looked at the financials of Halton and of Oakville, the budgeting process, and met with councillors and their staff. Meetings with elected and region, local and regional officials, which we also noted really care about their constituents. But as I mentioned, we welcome your observations, we welcome your recommendations, but we would propose we'd like to implement them with the existing structure we have. We can work with the local and regional governments. We're a grassroots nonpartisan group, so we don't think we're biased either way on any solutions. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have before the morning continues. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to pose a question? I guess I'll, let me start off. Um, in your review, are there things that uh, you came out that you would particularly recommend that uh, would have a bearing on what we're doing? Uh, do you have a copy of that report that we could review ourselves? Or? We, are, we have not produced a report yet because I would say we were in the process of that review and were interrupted by this process we're looking at today. But I can comment that we have and will continue to recommend, and I'm talking Oakville specifically and also to Halton, that there could be more focus on budget cutting, zero-based budgeting. And I'm an accountant, I'm a CPA myself, and so is my colleague, Jim Goodfellow, that works with me on the studies we've done so far. And I'm sure you will agree, municipal reporting is very opaque. It's often not accrual accounting. It's often difficult for the likes of me to reconcile anything to anything else when I look at the reports. It's very difficult to look at budget and actuals on a, on a go-forward basis. And uh, I would think our recommendations in the future would be to take massive reports and make them simpler for taxpayers and residents to understand. If uh, my colleague and I go through these things and wonder, where does this number come from and where does it go to? Where does this number end up in this summary report? Uh, I think that would help everyone understand the structure better. With respect to specifics, uh, we're not really at that point yet. I will mention, just as a matter of interest, the one focus we had was um, on transit, and there's no integration whatsoever within Halton on transit. Uh, I think the focus of transit is to get people to the GO train, and I can't tell you much beyond that uh, about what's involved in it. Uh, I read with very much interest the, the improvements Metrolinx had made, but it kind of stops when you get to the GO stations, and the feeders are a different responsibility altogether, and there's no coordination whatsoever there. So that is one thing we had started to look at. I don't yet have any recommendations. That's helpful, and, and I would say uh, neither of us are new to this field. Uh, we've been at it for decades, and and we're not, uh, uh, obviously, our CA, uh, CPA, and you understand this stuff. In, in Municipal yeah. accounting, not necessarily. Well, I guess my observation was we are encountering some of the same challenges you encountered. Thanks. Just an, perhaps an observation, but you and others have relied fairly heavily on the Fraser and C.D. Howe. You are aware that there are other views that don't necessarily accept the results of the Fraser Institute and the C.D. Howe Institute, and there are conflicting views on those reports. Yeah, but they, and nobody, and nobody seems to talk about them. Yes. So. I, actually, I take your point, and I, I regard them as different circumstances in a different time, but a warning, because at the time, it was all about cost reduction and History proved the cost reduction wasn't realized. And also, with no implication and suggestion that of a one solution fits all here, uh, it's showing that situations are different and you can't do that. I would say that's a helpful observation because that was one of the frustrations of this is people, I think, in each of the public meetings have referenced those studies. They are as you said, a particular point in time with a number of cross-cutting issues and the four municipalities, at least, that uh, uh, that one of the studies looked at, I wouldn't think there were a lot of parallels to the experience here, but uh, in any event, uh, appreciate your observation. Any other questions? I will turn the podium over to Nancy Robertson from the Chartwell Maple Grove Residents Association. Thank you very much. Ms. Robertson. 
if you would introduce yourself and uh, your organization, and uh, you have 10, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Fenn and Mr. Sealing. My name is Nancy Robertson, and I'm the president of the Chartwell Maple Grove Residents Association. Our group just celebrated our 10th anniversary, and we represent just over 1,800 homes in Oakville. CMGRA is also a supporter of We Love Oakville, on whose behalf we, I am presenting here today. Thank you for taking the time to come to Halton and for allowing us this opportunity to participate in this review process. We hope that you are able to see that we take this public consultation opportunity very seriously. We've taken time and energy to voluntarily do the preparation required to contribute to the process in what we hope is a meaningful way. For your reference, I do have a copy of my presentation notes at the end. I'm happy today to be speaking in support of Halton and Oakville current governance structure. When informed of this governance review, residents in the town of Oakville spoke out loudly and clearly, indicating that they value the voice that they have within this current system. Within a very short time frame, over 1,000 people began to follow the discussion on Facebook. It is clear that residents have anxiety and concern over change where it isn't needed. In the Polara survey that was completed in March, 81% of respondents in Oakville were satisfied overall with the level of service they were getting from local government. In 2017, it was also 81%. This is an important measurement given that the rest of the province surveyed by Polara sat at 61% and the 905 sat at 68%. We believe that Oakville is unique in many ways. One of these is the level of engagement and oversight by residents. Oakville has a history of public participation and public consultation that is second to none. I am sure that this is a, bless a mixed blessing sometimes to our local representatives, but it does bring a level of vibrancy and energy to the way in which our local government carries on the business of governing. And it certainly contributes to the overall sense of belonging and community that exists here in Oakville. There are seven wards in Oakville, each of approximately the same population size. That is somewhere between 32 and 38,000 residents. Each ward has two representatives, one of whom sits on the regional council. This makes for a 15 mem member Oakville council counting our mayor. The representatives here don't have offices at town hall or any administrative staff. They have a cell phone and they respond to constituents calls seven days a week. If a resident has a concern here, they are usually surprised to learn that they can call the representative directly to get a response to an issue. What we have here in Oakville is democracy at its best. It is the relationship that we have with our local representatives that allow this. Access to our elected officials provides Oakville residents with the ability to participate, to oversee, and perhaps even to affect better governance. The Halton population, according to the census in 2016, was 548,000 residents. And we have 42 upper and lower tier, tier representatives. This averages out to one representative per 13,100 residents. It is generally understood that the current system should serve us all the way to the forecasted population of 1 million in 2041. The city of Brockville, meanwhile, has a council of nine for a population of 22,000. That works out to one representative per 2,444 residents. Halton has more than five times as many residents per municipal representative as Brockville has. Bringing it closer to home, Oakville has 14 councillors while Burlington operates with seven. Yet because of the added administrative costs, including office space, it costs Burlington 120,000 more to run their council. History has shown that amalgamation actually costs communities more. Reducing the number of politicians has not had the desired effect of reducing costs. In fact, the research that Fraser Institute and Timothy Cobbin at Western University showed that administrative costs went up 
while residents in amalgamated cities complained that they must now speak to multiple layers of administrators before they can get a simple answer. Service went down. It is inevitable that amalgamation will cost more. There is a merging of collective bargaining units to manage. There's upward pressure to provide equal service levels to all areas of the newly amalgamated city. And for some reason in the research, the number of administrators, administrative roles increased well beyond the expectations. And yet, while costing more, residents felt they were getting less. In Oakville, the wage range for an administrative assistant at Town Hall is uh, on average a little more than the salary of a town councillor. But an elected representative will work seven days a week, many times from dawn to dusk, because this is not a job for them. Politicians do not get enough credit for their efforts, most of which go on behind. One might suggest that we have a bargain with the current system as it is. In fact, I will suggest that we are getting a bargain with the added benefit that there is a job review every four years. This is what democracy allows, and this is what might be lost. We do not believe there is a compelling reason to change the current structure of the Oakville Town Council or that of the Regional Council. We believe, in fact, that there is much to admire and to emulate. The four municipalities get along well and cooperate well together. We want to see this continue. There are already shared services at the region. If it makes economic sense and residents' quality of life increases, then bring on more shared services. In fact, the existing two-tier structure is seen to work to provide the best level of service that works for residents while allowing the opportunity to engage in shared services where it makes the most sense. Governance, governments cannot operate like a, a business. There, there are no profits to be achieved. We truly empathize with the position that you're in. Each municipality in Halton has its own distinct characteristics and concerns. We're just not sure that there could ever be a single recommendation that could be applied to all 82 municipalities. We prefer the Halton and Oakville model of cooperation, not amalgamation. We believe that we have an appropriate number of elected representatives to represent our population all the way to the year 2041. And we are certain that an effective two-tier structure is best for service delivery while allowing the opportunity for shared services when it is efficient and economical to do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Robertson. You made a comment, maybe I misheard you. You said there is an opportunity for more shared services. Do you have some suggestions? No, we're, uh, just, we're open to your suggestions. Uh, people talk about transit, but I, I, you know, I caution that in the four municipalities we have here in, in Oakville, uh, transit would be a very difficult thing to amalgamate. There are such different concerns. Halton Hills is a rural community. Um, and, and as, as Rick mentioned, everybody's trying to get to the ghost, uh, go train. So uh, one thing that could be certainly investigated in conjunction with Metrolinx, however, uh, would be better access to, to go. Thank you. Let me ask, I think you explained clearly what the contrasts are between having seven members of council as in Burlington and 14 as in uh, councillors, uh, excluding the mayor. Um, um, what's your observation? If, if you've worked with the town council, how do you feel that um, size of a decision-making body works well, and, and where does it uh, work and be improved? Well, in, in our experience, and we have certainly, my residence association uh, and myself personally have worked on all sorts of files in this town, um, I have never had an issue uh, getting a hold of anybody, uh, including phoning the mayor, you know, at 10.30 last night. So, you know, there's uh, we're, there's easy, easy access. Yeah, I wasn't too much talking about access, oh. which is the uh, their ability to make decisions decisively and to consider things. And uh, they, they operate on a consensus basis, which I think the public appreciates. So, and that is, I think, from, from what I know from the residents that we have spoken to, uh, people appreciate the consensus model that operates in our town. Thank you. 
ठीक है Running right along, our next speaker is Ted Haugen, uh, representing the West, Res West River Residents Association. Would you introduce yourself to the audience, and uh, you will have 10 minutes. Absolutely, yes. I'm Ted Hogan, president of West River Residents Association and chair of the We Love Oakville group. Um, I'm very glad to be here today, and I thank you very much for your patience. It uh, has probably been a very long grind for you, and Congratulations that it's the last day before the long weekend for you. Um, I'm basically going to be following the the presentation that you have received. Um, so I'll skip to page three and talk about the current state in Oakville. And some of this has been alluded to in some of the previous comments already. But together, Oakville and the region have worked very hard to manage spending that for many years uh, have seen our property taxes increase, increases and kept below the rate of inflation. And that's been for at least a decade. Well, this is a great achievement. There is always the potential to do better. Moody's credit rating for the region of Halton has been AAA for many, many years. But Moody's most recent assessment includes a note that amalgamation could put this rating at risk. A decrease in our credit rating could potentially raise the cost of operating here and therefore impact the province's desire to be open for business. Um, I'm also proud to note that Oakville was rated the number one place to live in Canada by Money Center magazine in 2018. On page four, presently about 52% of the program and operating expenses in Halton are managed at the regional level. These programs and services primarily are police and paramedic services, water, waste, and stormwater management, as well as public health services. The remaining 48% are managed at the municipal level and provides for such things as public transit, fire services, planning development and zoning, parks and recreation, gardens and trails and harbors. Given the geographic density, growth rate, and demographic differences of Halton's four municipalities, we feel that this almost 50-50 split is a good balance, and it seems to work well for the residents here. We expect that this municipal review will generate many good ideas from not just here, but the other regions as well, and uh, we hope that there will be additional improvements and efficiency ideas come out of this. So we are looking forward to recommendations. Uh, however, given that municipalities are very complex organizations, it's important to ensure that there are not unint unintended consequences. We therefore would encourage you strongly to publish a written report, not for the province to order compliance to, but for municipalities to use to do thorough analysis required to develop strong implement implementation plans as appropriate. This would enable our elected officials to help make the organizations they see to be more efficient and cost effective while giving us, the taxpayers, the ability to track and monitor, monitor to ensure that they are being held to account. So rather than order, we'd like recommendations that are our councils can implement. Uh, moving on to page five, I'm not going to take the entire 10 minutes so we can move on. Um, page five references the results of the 2019 Town of Oakville Citizen Survey that's been mentioned previously. Looking specifically at town survey, the, re the results show that 96% of residents surveyed said they were satisfied with town services. Now, I'd venture to say that that's as close to perfect as could be expected and certainly a score that the town should be very proud of achieving. It certainly reinforces the current strength of how services are delivered, both in Oakville and in Halton. As well, 88% of residents expressed overall satisfaction with their customer service experience in the town of Oakville. 
again, it's a high rating that I think shows the current regional municipal arrangement is one that is working extremely well. Uh, if you want to reference page six, it looks at two areas that initially appear to be ones that could be improved by regionalization, public transit and fire. In public transit, there are three separate and very different strategies in Oakville, Burlington, and Milton. Oakville has the most extensive transit network, followed by Burlington, with Milton having the least. Halton Hills has no public transit. Transit regionalization could potentially increase cost for all or result in service reductions for some, or some combination of those two. Uh, again, referring to this 2016 C.D. Howe study on how to improve service delivery in Canada City, it was noted that cooperation between transit systems would produce better outcomes than system amalgamations. And from the way we've implemented things in Halton and Oakville with the other three colleagues, I think that shows that there is some strength in, in that model. Regionalization of fire departments could also lead to potential cost increases and or service reductions due to the way the four systems are set up now. Oakville and Burlington have full-time professional firefighters. The Milton and Halton Hills Department use a combination of full-time and volunteer firefighters. Moving to a common model across Halton, therefore, would most likely increase the costs to level up services in Milton and Halton Hills or require a downgrade in the level of services for Oakville and Burlington, or costs would increase. The final uh, page is a chart showing the demographic differences between Halton's four municipalities uh, for your perusal, and that is it. Do you have any questions? I'm sure you do. I'm sure we do. A um, couple things. Uh, one of the things we uh, hear in these um, meetings quite regularly is people jump quite quickly to structure rather than looking at some of the things we're equally interested in, which is improvements in service delivery and uh, opportunities for cost reductions and improved productivity and things of that kind. Uh, you highlighted the uh, transit function, which I think is a, a useful one for you to point out because it does raise some of those uh, public policy issues about cost versus service, equalizing service, things of that kind. Um, it, my observation would be that um, the municipalities within Halton Region have addressed some of that equalization issue on other uh, functions. Certainly uh, water and wastewater would be one that would be obvious, uh, some of the things in the social services field. Um, I'm wondering why you distinguish transit as being one where if you um, took a comprehensive approach, it would inevitably cost more and therefore shouldn't be considered. Uh, I, it seemed like an odd conclusion. No, I, I understand and let me clarify. We are not against cooperate cooperatively between the four municipalities talking about an expansion or, or spreading of transit services. I think what we are most worried about is having something imposed an amalgamation of the four systems, which now work on different, uh, one works on a grid system, one works feeding the GO train stations, Milton works along just main streets, and Halton Hills, for example, doesn't have any bus transit service at all. So if something were imposed, we're very afraid that costs would go up, uh, it would mean a complete reorganization higher transit system, and therefore we are asking if there are recommendations, for example, on transit, that they be some, they be left up to the region to work together to cooperate and to find efficiencies and whatever service expense and from there, but not imposed, but to work through the transit system, for example, the way they have through the other shared services. Uh, I guess I have two questions on that, really. Uh, one is um, I'm familiar with both models of doing things by intermunicipal agreement and doing things around a table like this where choices get made and, uh, and 
conclusions are drawn from that. Uh, my observation would be it's difficult to get people to agree to something that's going to cost them money in order to subsidize their neighbors. And there's a lot of that discussion, not just in this region, but in some others I could name. Um, so that's, um, I, I'm interested in how you get around that kind of issue. The second point that you raised, I think, is a really quite a valid one, which is the principles of what we're trying to do and uh, the, probably the recommendations that we make have a lot of implementation implications. And I think your uh, caution or suggestion that anything that's anticipated as a direction to follow should be carefully worked out with the municipalities and the different ways in which things could be implemented uh, should be thoroughly considered. I think that's a very valid observation and one that we will probably uh, um, take, uh, take to heart. Thank you. Uh, just, you caught my eye when you said that Moody's has given a warning against amalgamation. What's come from Moody's that would do that? Do you have, um, is there some documentation? There, it's in your, I'm, it's in I'm your not portfolio. sure of the document, but I will find it. I will find it for you today, and get it to you. But in their latest report, there was uh, a note that any any amalgamation could have an effect on a credit rating. I don't have the document with me, but I will find it for you and and get it to you. Okay. And I was just sort of curious on your 5248 split, and that may very well be true. Um, because normally in most of the regions it's about a 65-35 split, um, so it's rather low. But maybe that, maybe it's a trance that accounts for that. But does Oakville have a much higher level of services? Because I notice in the property tax comparisons that the property taxes in Oakville are considerably higher at the local level than they are in other Halton uh, municipalities. Is that the is that what accounts for that difference in split? Um, I don't want to sound like I'm from Oakville. But uh, we think that we have higher levels of services in in many areas, in recreation, in transit, uh, in fire, and and certainly our tax increases have been below the rate of inflation. But they we acknowledge that they are high. But and when I mention that to people, and I've talked to a lot of people throughout this campaign, um, the the general response is, yes, we know we pay for things, but we're, we're fine paying more for higher services. I was just trying to get at the difference in split from what we see normally in, in most regions, and whether that's unique to Oakville or whether that's region I, I, I really yeah. can't speak to other municipalities, but I, I will note that as, I think that Oakville, um, I believe Oakville does pay more than their share of the 50-50 the, the split when it comes to taxes. So we are subsidizing the other municipalities. Uh, and again, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an accountant. I don't have the figures in front of me. But we do pay more than our share in the region already. And it's been working well, so we haven't I was back referring, on that. I was referring to the split between the lower tier at levy and the upper tier levy. Yeah, not, not I, between, I, can't, so. I can't speak to, okay, that's fine. to other municipalities. That's I'm fine. sorry. I guess the, the, that raises another question that um, was just mentioned in passing. You referenced the, uh, the impact of amalgamation uh, of services. I'm not talking about amalgamation of municipalities um, in some areas. I, I guess a couple points I thought uh, were um, forward in your presentation that probably needs a little emphasis. Uh, one is the, the, what we were just talking about, the split between upper tier and lower tier. Uh, the, the, the way in which costs um, are um, affected in, uh, in amalgamation of services tends to be when they are offered by a number of different parties and brought together. Um, a, a large number of municipal functions are already um, at the upper tier here and elsewhere. So uh, when people talk about overall impact, uh, obviously we're just talking about the impact on those things that are not currently uh, um, administered in a, in a uniform way. So that, I think that's important to, peop to make people understand because it, it's a materially different thing than you would see in, in, a, in a freestanding municipality getting together with another one. Right. Um, the other thing that you mentioned was fire. Uh, one of the things that has changed there, and I um, mean, Burlington, for example, had a long history of having both full-time and uh, composite uh, fire departments. Um, 
um, fire stations. Um, there are, have been changes in the legislation recently that preserve existing arrangements. So I guess one of the things that um, some of the studies that Mr. Sealing referred to have presumed is that there be an homogenization of these things doesn't necessarily have to have it's a question of political choice I think and the other is about the wage rates uh, I think you would find that the wage rates across municipal employee groups in uh, in Halton are are not wildly different uh, it makes a big difference as those studies indicate if you take a rural area into a an urban area that's a different proposition but uh, um, uh, one of the things that I think we've concluded is uh, one size doesn't fit all, not all the nine areas are the same, and, and so it's important to peel back that onion a little to, to find out whether there are uh, material differences in the comparisons before you draw any conclusions. So, right, but, and, and we agree that uh, there, there may be opportunities for, for growth in, in fire and transit, uh, but I think it would, we'd, we'd be very disappointed if it was left up to the municipalities to work that through if there was something imposed from on high that would legislate we get together. And I think the history of how the region's, region has worked together with the four municipalities shows that we can work through those sorts of issues. Yeah, I think the, the material difference there is whether to do it and how to do it. I, I subscribe fully to what you said about how to do it, right. whether to do it some things can't be achieved by consensus, but in any event, thanks. Yes. Yeah, you were, you were recommending triple majority for any kind of service change, and <clears throat> enough said. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, and you have left your material with us, so we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule. Um, but they're all the same group. Uh, per, if, um, but we'll continue on. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Chalmers, are you ready to roll? Uh, well, we will uh, be generous with your time, and we appreciate you starting early. And if you could introduce yourself yes, to I the will. audience, please. And you'll have 10 minutes. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Chalmers, and I'm the president of the Joshua Creek Residents Association in Oakville, um, or JCRA as we are typically known. We're a community-based volunteer group that was created in 1974 and we represent approximately 2,000 households today. JCRA is a member of the We Love Oakville Stop Amalgamation Campaign, and so I'm here as JCRA's representative on the We Love Oakville uh, Campaign Committee. The citizens of Oakville are very interested and very engaged in the regional government review and the review process. What does that engagement look like? Well, all active Oakville residents associations the three Oakville Business Improvement Associations and other community groups such as Oakville Green and the East Lake Chinese Association support We Love Oakville. Together, those groups represent 900 local businesses and about 13,000 households here in Oakville. That's almost 20% of all households in Oakville. Support that was garnered within three months and with the minimal communications budget. How did Oakville become engaged? Through the We Love Oakville website, through the Facebook page, through Twitter and Instagram, through print and television media coverage that we've garnered, and through good old fashioned word of mouth. So how has Oakville responded? Well, to date, 1,300 plus letters of support for this campaign have been sent to our MPPs and the Premier, over 1,000 followers on Facebook, approximately $23,000 in donations, 1,000 lawn signs and counting have been requested by residents, and there's about 500 subscribers to our e-newsletter, and they're still coming as well. So the citizens are fully engaged and interested because we want our voices to be heard, and because we want to have transparency in the process. And to that end, we welcome the public consultation, and we thank you for the opportunity to provide our voices today. We also believe that more time should be allocated for a thorough review and analysis, given that municipalities are complex organizations that provide an enormous range of services. The review and the analysis should be commensurate with that level of complexity. Citizen engagement and interest both extend through the final recommendations and any decisions that are made based on those recommendations. 
So we would note that approval of voluntary changes in regional representation on regional councils requires a triple majority vote as set forth in section 219 of the Municipal Act. So a majority of regional council plus a majority of the lower tier councils who represent a majority of the electors. Prior to the 2018 municipal election, the region of Halton expanded its council by three members, adding two seats for Milton and one for Oakville's new Ward 7 via Halton Bylaws 6916. This change was made in recognition of the population increases in those areas, and the analysis for that was a long time coming. The Halton region conducted a triple majority vote, which enabled the region to voluntarily expand its council from 21 to 24 members with provincial approval as per the Municipal Act. It's the citizen taxpayers who will bear the financial costs and risks of decisions made for our region and for our municipalities. So accordingly, taxpayers should have the right, either directly or through their councillors, to accept or reject any such proposals. We therefore ask that you recommend that a triple majority vote or a citizen vote be required before any amalgamation, any restructuring of local or regional councils, or any further regionalization of programs or services, or reversal of regional programs and services are enacted during or subsequent to the regional government review. Thank you. That ends the formal part. Thank you very much. So be devil's advocate with you for a minute. Pardon me? <laughs> so uh, basically the presentations we've heard so far from Halton and yourselves are everything's fine, leave it alone, um, don't make any changes. Um, <laughs> And also, any changes you want subject to a triple majority. Triple majority is three. <laughs> triple majority. There are only four, four municipalities here. So how would any change happen in Halton Region, given the fact that the councils have taken the position that nothing should change, and um, it, you need a triple majority to change everything, anything in the, in the process? I don't think we're saying that absolutely nothing should change. And we're not saying that we're not open to changes and to um, continual review of what's done for the services. Um, I think there's a concern about um, forced amalgamations and forced changes that um, do not have consultation or public say. This is great, we're having these consultations now. There's a survey going out, um, but any recommendations or proposals should be subject to review and analysis. Halton Region was able to expand its, its, its membership or increase the number of uh, counselors through that triple majority vote. So I think it's a reasonable way to uh, to look at other changes as well. I guess my observation on that would be to get municipal councils to agree to add more municipal councillors is not a, uh, the highest bar to get over, um, but um, there are going to be some more difficult uh, issues facing the community coming uh, both in terms of economic issues, uh, environmental issues, things of that kind where consensus may not be the only uh, course that's available. So I guess I'd be interested in knowing, in, beyond just the discussion about amalgamating of municipalities, which seems to be the uh, where some of this conversation's landed, which uh, I won't speak for uh, from the review, I'll speak for myself. It seems to me that's something that you reach at the end of the discussion, not at the beginning. Um, so I'm wondering what um, opportunities for change, improvement, cost reduction, uh, f addressing future issues that your organization has identified as things that need to be uh, grappled with and perhaps uh, in a way that uh, a triple majority wouldn't lend itself to addressing. Well, I think you've heard earlier about some of the transportation issues. Um, access to the GO train is important, not just for residents, but for employers here in the Oakland municipality. I can't speak for the other ones. We've heard that um, from businesses here. So those things would perhaps be a priority. Um, I think we already have structures in place to allow for public consultation, and that triple majority is something that should be considered irrespective of what the issue is, or maybe that also needs to be considered as to whether or not that's the best method for doing that. But we do have those structures set up um, to allow for that kind of consultation. 
And so I don't know if it's, if it's correct to say that it's not going to work um, for other issues beyond expanding councillors. That is something, well, I, I don't know if there's research or if there's other examples where it's been done and it's not been successful or has been successful, but I think that can be part of that review and analysis so that we know that it's a thorough one that's gone through. I mean, lots of people vote and don't get what they want when they vote. <laughs> it's not an uncommon thing in a, de in a democracy. We've made a decision that we go with the majority and we try to make sure that the minority is also addressed to some extent. Fair comment. Uh, one other thing that I was interested in is uh, in going around the province, we've gone to places like uh, Oxford County or uh, Durham region where uh, the future of the automobile industry has been um, a pretty lively local topic. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of the, um, leaving aside the um, case that you're making on behalf of good services to residents, uh, do you have any comments about the business environment and whether municipal governments in this part of the world are doing enough to accommodate uh, economic growth, employment creation, things of that, or to protect uh, uh, the good position you're already in? I actually think one of the advantages of the regional system is that there is a regional governance structure that can address a wider issue beyond one individual municipality. So in, in Durham, presumably not everybody that works at GM lives in Oshawa, they live in other municipalities. So they have a council, a Durham Region Council that can address those issues. Um, and so, I mean, I think it does happen here in Halton that those are, are done. I know Halton Region does certain things for businesses and the municipalities do them. You, you mentioned earlier about how there was a big focus on C.D. Howe and Fraser Institute, but We Love Oakville has a link to a report a uh, 2013 report called Merging Municipalities is Bigger Better. It was authored by Enid Slack and Richard Bird, who are from the Monk School of Governance at the University of Toronto. And, and I, I was thinking about it as you said that because they don't just talk about negative aspects. They actually list some of the benefits. They, they look at the bigger picture of municipalities and then they looked at Toronto, the specific experience there. And they specify some of what they saw were benefits to Toronto and um, to the amalgamation of Toronto in the late 90s. And one of them was the um, obviously equalization of services because it wasn't the same across the six cities and the, met uh, the Metro Toronto. But one of the other points was how they were able to use that to build a better economic development profile. One of the conclusions of the report is that there's no perfect government structure, but that the two tier regional system may be the best system for allowing the kind of shared services or shared costs, coordination of services, and ability to bring profile to region, while at the same time allowing for the access that um, to government that citizens get in a smaller municipality. I very much appreciate that answer. We've actually met with Dr. Bird and okay. Dr. Uh, Slack. <laughs> I think they but, do quite a bit of, but, quite a bit. Uh, well, um, but your other observation about uh, the way in which this community, or these communities can uh, address economic development issues uh, that are coming towards us, uh, it's very thoughtful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rick just came in. Rick Goldring just came in. So. <clears throat> We're running a little bit uh, ahead of schedule. Um, is uh, Mr. Rick Goldring here? Yes. If we can uh, hurry you uh, to the mic, uh, if you're prepared, if you could introduce yourself to anyone who doesn't know who you are, and uh, um, you will have uh, five minutes or so for your presentation, and then we may have some questions following that. Wonderful. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, right. Thank you very much for hosting this uh, event. Congratulations on your appointment as Special Advisor to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to review the effectiveness of, of regional government. It's a, it's a tall order. It hasn't been done for a while. It makes sense for you guys to be involved uh, doing it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rick Goldring, former mayor of the city of Burlington. And uh, I'm here to provide some remarks with regard to uh, the work that is underway. And I believe I'm in a good position to provide perspective after having served with this council of the Halton Region for 12 years. And the fact that I'm no longer an elected official provides me the opportunity to impart some unfettered input without concern about political ramifications. <laughs> but let... <laughs> Like that, did you? <laughs> so let me state this at, at the outset. I firmly believe that Halton Region works exceptionally well. Uh, waste management, water, wastewater, paramedic services, police, public health, housing, and social services 
are all critically important services that are delivered efficiently and effectively. The relationship between the elected officials here at the region and then the local municipalities and the staff of the region and the local municipalities uh, is very positive for the most part. So overall, I believe Halton Region is a great example of how regional government can work and should work. But the lens that should be used in reviewing Halton Region is to consider how a good situation can become better. So here are three items for uh, consideration that I strongly believe have merit. You know, I look at uh, single tier cities like Windsor and London, uh, and they have uh, one official plan. I look at Barrie and Guelph, which are cities in a similar size of Alton Region municipalities, and they have one official plan. And we look at the uh, complexity of Alton Region and other regions when there is a regional official plan and a local official plan. And I've had an opportunity over the last 12 years to see how those plans are developed. And I strongly believe that there is merit in the consideration of having one official plan for Halton Region and having it developed here and led by a policy team at the region. I see great merit in having some clarity uh, of process and clarity of once you have a plan uh, that it's in place, that it's up to the local municipalities to execute and implement on that plan. All the policy team for Halton Region could be here, but obviously the local municipalities would be responsible for the implementation of the plan and dealing with uh, development applications. So that is my first suggestion for consideration. Uh, the second one is governance. I believe there should be clarity around the process of determining how many councillors serve Alton Regional Council. And during the last term of Regional Council, we had an opportunity to vote on increasing the size of council. Uh, and we did that. Uh, Milton has two more members now. Oakville has one. And really the discussion was based on where the population growth is going, not where it is. And I strongly said at the time, and I'll strongly say again now, there should be a clear process for considering changes or reallocation of regional representation, and it should be based on real data like a census. The province and the federal government use a census to determine reallocation of, of uh, seats at Queen's Park and Parliament Hill, and the regions should do the same. I would suggest that consideration be uh, looked at for not just Halton. And my final recommendation for consideration is public relation to public transit and transportation planning. You know, in Halton region, we're part of the greater Toronto Hamilton area uh, that has a multitude of different transit authorities uh, across the uh, across the region from Durham and York to Mississauga and, and Brampton and to, in a size, in a small regional municipality like Halton, we have three um, transit authorities for Milton, Oakville and Burlington. And I'm not sure if Halton knows this has a transit authority yet, but they're going to head that way at some point. So I believe there's merit in pushing all the transit to the region. You have that in Waterloo region and Durham and York, as I mentioned, and it makes sense to consider that for Halton. But if you're going to have transit at the region, you need to look at overarching transportation planning and planning for mobility to take place at the region as well, because transit and transportation planning go hand in hand. That's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, those are the big three points as far as I'm concerned. There may be some other ways to improve uh, the region, but I'm going to focus on three. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. Well, as we said at the outset, we uh, will pose questions that are not necessarily indicative of where we're going or what we're thinking, but uh, to explore your ideas. So I'll. So, uh, uh, although I need to clarify the, the split here, but the largest proportion, the majority of the, the tax levy, the municipal property tax levy goes to the region. And in the question of uh, accountability and, and elections, uh, do you, what's your views on directly elected regional councillors who are elected for regional issues as opposed to being elected based on the fact that they're running at both levels? You know, it's interesting. I, know, I do know in Waterloo Region and Niagara Region there's a different system. And in Waterloo Region, and when you run for council, you're running for a local council or you're running for a regional council. You're not running for both. And you know, I've, I've had opportunity to discuss with people that serve in Niagara or, or Waterloo Region about how well that works. 
And I would suggest the methodology that we have in Halton Region does work, where you have people elected both levels because they're they're intertwined, and when you're elected for both, uh, you understand uh, the issues from both, and you're not uh, in a position where you're only focusing on one part of the pie. In order to look at the, the, the big picture, you need to be in both councils, and I believe you have in Halton Region. It makes a lot of sense. So whose interests come first when there's a difference between the lower tier and the upper tier? So, for example, when the uh, the uh, assessment out of Toronto was just disappeared and uh, that, that, that what the region had been levying for, what did the area municipalities do in Halton to that money? Well, we uh, we had a bit of a... They, they took it away from us and then we got it back. Um, so the question was, what did... So I'm just saying, is there a conflict when they serve at both levels? Because in that instance, uh, my, my recollection, my recollection was that even though the region taxed for it, the area municipalities banded together to strip it out of the region. Yeah, that's what happened. Coffers. Yeah, that's what happened. Uh, but, you know, is it the, are the local municipalities subservient to the region or is the region subservient to the local municipalities? Well, do you not see them as two both equal and different forms of government? I, I, I do, yeah. but I think there was, you know, the region was set up to provide services that were far more efficiently and effectively delivered at the regional level, like water, wastewater, and waste management, uh, than, it, than they could be delivered at the, the local level. So that's why the region was uh, was set up. But I think, you know, recognizing what, what happened a number of years ago, I guess 10 or 11 years ago with the pooling dollars, I think it's up to a regional council to decide how those dollars could be allocated and if dollars ended up going back to local municipalities. And that's what the duly elected uh, people uh, we're comfortable with. I don't see anything wrong with that. So, uh, I don't want to put it too long, but I'm just saying uh, they, the regional councillors then sat as local councillors as opposed to, to put it on their, their local council hat when they sat here to take the money that was the regional money and strip it and send it down to the lower tier. Yeah, that, that's that's one issue we may uh, you know disagree on, but I think there's far more examples of uh, well thought out regional collaboration where people left their local municipality at home and really looked at the benefit of, of the region and what the region's you know, trying to achieve and whatever policy issue we're dealing with at the time. So in your experience here, um, are the regional councillors, when they get elected, are they elected on regional issues or are they elected on what's going on in the local municipality and the regional piece is just an add-on? Or, yeah, or are they elected on regional issues? I would suggest, Ken, that the, the hot-button issues are at the local level. You know, the local level deal with parks, the local level deals with development applications and so many municipalities, not just Burlington, but so many uh, municipalities, development is uh, the major issue. So maybe it sh there should be some focus at the region or focus at the province because of development issues, but it all gets focused down to the local level. So when you're running for uh, re-election, uh, your focus is on uh, running for election or re-election, your focus tends to be on the local issues in the local municipality. And uh, I remember my very first all candidates meeting running for mayor in 2010, the first question I got in all candidates meeting was, what's the biggest issue uh, facing us at the region? And I thought, yeah, I wasn't prepared for that. I was prepared for all the local issues, but it's true. The region deals with the big picture issues, water, wastewater, um, and, and uh, waste management and police and ambulance and so on and so forth. And typically, the, the domain of those particular services or those departments, there are not issues during election time. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, um, first, just continuing on on the governance uh, question, your idea of uh, using um, um, population census to reallocate members of regional council, uh, if um, if population growth is not dealt with by adding to council, which has been the pattern up till now, and it's dealt with by reallocation using a census model, that also gives you the opportunity to reduce the total size of regional council. Do you see any merit in that? Um, at, at some point, possibly. You know, you don't want the size of regional council to become uh, too big. I'm not sure what the number is. I'm sure you've heard all sorts of ideas, the ideal size of a municipal council is. But clearly, when you're doing a review of representation, and it should be on a regular basis, whether it's every two terms or every three terms, there should be some mechanism that kicks in to review the regional representation around the council table. Um, 
one of the things we may have to consider is giving a municipality that has grown more than another more more positions and taking away from another local. I don't think that is that is a bad thing. I think we need to be prepared to do that because if it keeps on going, uh, at one point, uh, Alton Region was more than 24 that it has now. It's down to, it went down to 21, and now it's back up to 24. It's going to be a million people in 2041. Does that mean that you automatically increase the numbers? Or are you just inc because there's more people? Or do you adjust the numbers based on different growth rates in the different local municipalities? Uh, second uh, question is related to your suggestion about the official plan. What we, in the, as we go around the, the nine areas that we're looking at, there are different arrangements in terms of the planning programs. Uh, we, you know, there's an example where the the only official plan is an upper tier plan, <coughs> and the services are and the you know the development related issues are handled locally, like you uh, suggested. Uh, we've got the reverse uh, situation in. Uh, in, in large measure in the in one of the counties we're looking at um, I think the, the feedback we would probably get if we talk to the business community is that or at least in the development industry uh, that having two rounds of public meetings two rounds of rezonings two rounds of official plan amendments is adds to the cost of doing business and the time for uh, getting housing produced and all that goes along with that uh, so I'm interested in knowing how you think that would play out because I think as you identified uh, planning issues are always going to be local issues and yet a lot of the issues that are addressed in terms of infrastructure do have more of an upper tier flavor so what would that what would that structure look like do you think well in order to have a, a one official plan at the regional level you need to engage properly at the local level so there's no question about that but in order to, to get to that uh, consensus, our majority vote, where council votes on that particular regional official plan, and it's one official plan for the whole region, you've got to make sure that you've been very thorough. You can check all the boxes with regard to the uh, consultations that you had with the various stakeholders in the community. You have to make sure that's done. I just look at the process that we entered into uh, last year, and I, you know, new councils pressed a reset button with regard to the official plan in Burlington, which is certainly their right to, to do so. Um, but we adopted an official plan in April, and then it's all packaged up. It's put into the trunk of our planning director's car, and it comes down here to, to the region, and then the region has seven months to, to digest it and to come back to say, no, we didn't, you know, the city didn't get it right. There needs to be this change, that change. You need to look at this. You need to look at that. So I'm thinking that if it was all done, through the region, all those issues would be addressed during the whole process, as opposed to dragging it out, which is what's taking place now. I, I, I believe it's a farm, you know, the big one of the big issues that you're asked to look at is, you know, service delivery. Well, it's not a good service that we have right now with regard to two official plans um, in the region of Halton for a municipality, in my view. Takes me back to one of my earlier questions, is that the idea of a single plan is very attractive, and at the regional level, which implies that the region will, will in fact, um, manage the single official plan. And uh, if that's the case, if, if we move to official plan, and uh, some of the regional approvals, as you know, are delegated authorities from the province, some of them are within the plan itself. But how do you ensure uh, compliance then um, when, the, when the councillors sitting around the horseshoe will ultimately make the decision or the lower tier councillors? Is there a is there an issue or is there a potential problem there? So, you know, I did think about that to some degree. But right now, the chief planning for the region of Halton is the, is the authority that approves uh, local municipal um, official plans. So if you had one regional plan, you didn't have the local plans, you may have to push that planning authority up to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for the final approval of the uh, official plan here locally. Which is the what it is in a lot of single tier cities anyway. So right. Um, one other related issue is uh, you've talked about uh, better integration of transportation across the region, and uh, I guess the other th other than planning issues, traffic issues are probably very much a local uh, uh, municipal issue. How would your suggestion about uh, doing master transportation planning at the region interface with the um, regular? Uh, a diet of uh, traffic related issues that comes up at, uh, at City Hall? Well, my view that the, the what should be looked at is having the 
the long-term planning, the comprehensive transportation transit planning should happen in this building. That's where the focus should be, but obviously with input from the, uh, the local municipality. Uh, I believe it's the local municipality's uh, responsibility and should continue the responsibility to implement on the transportation policy that's, uh, that's developed in time. It's, it's their job to, to impl uh, implement and execute uh, the plans and policies that are developed. You know, it's very challenging right now, transportation, because we tend to look for a rearview mirror. And there's going to be significant changes happening in transportation and mobility the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And we don't really have an idea what that looks like. So we need to create an entity. And, you know, maybe it isn't necessarily a single uh, policy group here at the region, but we need to create an entity that is looking forward and not through the rearview mirror and, 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 and attempting to address the big picture of transportation with a million people in all the region, but within 22 years and the associated job growth. And we already have significant congestion on our on our provincial highways and our regional roads and our, and our local roads. We need to really get our head around how that's going to work. And I, and it is a regional issue. Yes, the local issue, there's local traffic, but in open, the, um, you know, we, we travel interregionally and interregionally all the time. And, the, you know, the patterns have to be looked at on that basis. And I firmly believe we need an entity that can really analyze effectively and project and lead us where we need to be led with regard to transportation in the next 20, 25 years. Because if we, do, if we just do things the way we've always done, we're in even more trouble than we are now when it comes time to congestion. I appreciate your comments about automated vehicles and ride sharing and that kind of thing. You're right about that. Those are the kinds of things we are looking for people to give us input on in particular because uh, the way things are now is the way things were and uh, it's not necessarily the way they're going to be so um, thank you very much that's very thank much you. appreciated thank, thank you thanks i think we'll take a short break uh, right now and then uh, the next speaker is uh dave marsden
Our next registered speakers are Ann and Dave Marsden. Uh, they have uh, five minutes. Ann and Dave Marsden are community health, safety and access advocates working using our own dime for the well-being of all who call Canada home and appropriate utilization of our tax dollars to achieve this. We see this process we are part of today as being similar to the mapping of a very large uncut diamond. The two of you are the mappers identifying for the Ford government, the diamond cutter, where and how the cuts need to be made to end up with Halton and his municipalities becoming either several sparkling diamonds or one magnificent diamond. While some cut diamonds just for their size, a skilled diamond cutter will cut to maximize its true brilliance. It is the quality of the cut that makes the difference. And so it is for our region. It is the, it is the quality of the cut or cuts based on evidence you have received since the review began that will make the difference. Will we continue on the downhill slope of failed service delivery and improper decision making identified by our audits and confirmed by the fall consultation we undertook in the last municipal election? A consultation that resulted in over 41,000 Halton residents choose myself to be their voice at this lectern. And to put that in perspective, in the city of Burlington, I spent $150 on that consultation and received more uh, approvals to be this voice than did the incumbent mayor who spent over $100,000. The results of our audits seriously question the ability of those in command to understand the requirement for all government actions to be in compliance with rule of law. Non-compliance affects the well-being and safety of Halton residents. One audit shows non-compliance with health protection legislation preceded 76 deaths. Another audit questions whether non-compliance with the Municipal Elections Act sees decisions valued at over a billion dollars were made within jurisdictional boundaries. <clears throat> Dave and I have been applying our well-referenced audit skills to government decision-making, service delivery, and compliance with legislation to Halton Region and one of its municipalities, the City of Burlington, for decades. Our book, Marsdens.ca, expected to be published in 2019. We're leaving you a copy of the current draft. Summarizes some, but far from all the audits we have conducted that show the true status of decision-making and service delivery. We are well referenced to do what you have asked of us through this review. Two of the present Halton Region Deputy Chiefs of Police and the President of Opal Hydro will confirm Dave's role in assisting police and the Crown to serve and protect the people of Halton and put a very large amount of stolen public money back in the coffers of Oakville Hydro using his skill set. I am a nationally referenced, respected and referenced service delivery QA consultant and a paper I presented at an international conference related to Halton service delivery became an international educational tool. Five minutes is only long enough to introduce what has happened to the Halton we believe sparkled like a magnificent diamond when Mr. Fenn left his duties as city manager with Burlington to take up others with our neighbor Hamilton. And I did experience uh, Mr. Fenn's capabilities helping to make it sparkle like a diamond. <clears throat> 20 years ago, sorry, one of the speakers today said, what they have in Oakville is democracy, democracy at its best. The first organization this morning 
to speak, had the opportunity to speak to our regional council to express their views about this review. We, who represent over 41,000 votes, were denied that opportunity to speak in these chambers. This is democracy at its worst. And whatever this review does, we must see this change. The people must be part of the decision-making process, and those they choose to represent their voice at this lectern should be allowed to speak at this lectern, which we haven't been able to do at the day of our eye since 2002. Minister Clark, Premier Ford, and his caucus will, we are confident, with your help, make the necessary decisions to turn our vision based on our audit into a one-tier reality. Why do we say one-tier? Because what we have is not working. Some examples. 20 years ago, I sat on a committee which agreed we would have paratransport that would take people from the municipalities to their doctor's appointment, regardless of which municipality they had to go. What was the hot topic of this election? Why can't we have para, a regional paratransport system? We still don't have it 22 years later. And is it that the voices weren't crying out for it? There were. That's just one example. Another example, in the last elec uh, after the last election, uh, the Police Services Board budget put forward um, their recommendation that there be um, an amalgamated police services building, Halton Hills would lose theirs, and it would go to Milton, and it would serve both. In the documentation before council, which we asked to um, speak to council on, and were denied again, it said that there had been consultation with people. No one we consulted with had even heard of the fact that they were going to amalgamate police services with Halton Hills and um, Milton. That's how much cooperation there's been in this council for the last 20 years. That, me coming into this chamber, was a great example of what's deteriorated, Mr. Fenn, since you were in the city manager in, in Burlington. At, at my instigation, city council took away one step from the city, um, from the council podium and sent the message out, it does not matter if you can walk or not walk. You have a place at our council table. That, after the laws we have in place today and the lack of dignity and everybody had to take a break so I could be brought to this lectern was, is a disgrace. And it's an example how we have deteriorated in this community from when you left us, Mr. Fenn. And I'm not saying that's all your fault. <laughs> um, Minister Clark, Premier Ford and his caucus, will, we are confident, with your help, make the necessary decisions to turn our vision based on our audits into a one-tier reality. Yes, I'm repeating myself. God bless you and thank you on behalf of our Ontario for your efforts and commitment to a better, more effective and efficient form of regional government throughout Ontario than we presently have. One that will see all Ontario residents, no matter their circumstances or abilities, thrive far better than our audit show they have been doing. And we will be leaving you a copy of our book uh, in draft form. So, and you've got our phone number, our email, any questions, we would be very pleased to share um, how we got, what we got, etc. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the personal comments. Um, do you have any questions? Could you uh, explain to me what your audit was? Which you talked one? about your, well, take one of them. <laughs> when you keep referring to audits, so I'm curious to what your okay. audit is. Okay. Um, um, I was trained in these audit skills um, at the feet of internationally respected people. 
And Dave was also trained by the federal government in how to accomplish what we call legislation compliance audits. In other words, we take what the legislation says, how you must act, and then we do an audit and see if you have accomplished that. Um, I can think of one that, um, uh, for example, uh, the healthcare one, the health protection one. Um, in 2006, um, Burlington experienced the worst um, number of deaths, the most number of deaths, etc., from a C. diff, which is a bacterial gastroenteritis outbreak, in ever. Okay, um, I said 76 there, but in actual fact, the death toll was a lot was more than that. Um, they um, claimed, the hospital claimed, and the city council representative on the board claimed. Um, that um, the, they didn't know anything about this um, C. diff um, outbreak. And two years later, we received the evidence that they did. They knew on one piece of paper, and it's, it's in the book, one piece of paper showed that Joseph Brand Hospital knew they had an outbreak level, according to the health protection legislation of C. diff, April 8th, 9th, 2006. And they ignored it until January 2007, when they brought in Michael Gardam. And uh, even he did discover this hidden document, which was just one. Um, we have taken that um, and what it means to the community. We've taken it to uh, the city of Burlington. We took it to the city representatives. We've tried to bring it here, the audit and its results, so that the public could know and see for themselves and ask questions and take it forward as a, a, a review, judicial review to get a judge's opinion on it. And um, we were denied access to this lecture at all since 2002. For some reason, there was a council direction saying we could never stand at this lectern again. Thank you for proving them wrong. We will stand at this lectern. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Our next registered uh, speaker is Angela Morgan, representing the Association of Municipal uh, Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario. And I will declare a conflict. I'm a long-standing member of that organization. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, as uh, Mr. Fenn mentioned, my name is Angela Morgan, and I'm president of the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario. AMCTO is Ontario's largest voluntary association of local government professionals, representing more than 2,000 members across nearly every municipality in Ontario. As one of the associations named in the terms of reference, we are pleased to be here today to share our views on the Regional Governance Review. It is a first step in what we hope will be a broad consultation with us on the best way to deliver municipal services in the areas identified. And I just want to clarify for the audience that our comments relate to the, re the review as a whole and not the region of home. AMCTO's members support the periodic review of municipal structures as important to good governance. We do view this panel as a chance for our members who work with the, within these structures every day to provide input. Our members understand the role they play as professional administrators. We know what works and what doesn't, and we're happy to offer advice. We are always supportive of good governance and support increased efficiencies where they do not affect ongoing service delivery. And although we do not have a specific position on a model that hasn't been formally proposed, we do believe that there are a few key principles the review panel should consider. A healthy democracy is a transparent democracy, and it is our view that this review should also be transparent. We ask that the panel's final report to the minister be made public so that Ontarians can better understand the options the panel is recommending. 
AMCTO membership serves virtually every community in Ontario, and we know how diverse the province is. Every municipality has unique circumstances, pressures, and problems. Any solutions to those problems must take into account the municipality's character, history, and environment. AMCTO members are specialists in local government administration. Existing structures work in large part due to their efforts and expertise in implementation. It is our view that any changes to existing structures should be made in the context of the municipality's needs and the community's desires. In short, we believe that the provincial government should trust local governments when it comes to the best ways to deliver municipal services. Ontario's local government professionals work day in and day out to support the elected councils that develop policy, authorize expenditures, and create programs to make each municipality a real community for the residents that call it home. We realize that there is no one way to deliver municipal services, and so we will not presuppose what this panel will recommend. We do, however, hope that this panel will use the principles we have recommended to inform their final report and that the Minister will share the report publicly in support of improved governance structures. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, I, we should probably clarify for the uh, those assembled here that uh, the report we've been asked to prepare, or we've been appointed special advisors by the Ontario government under Ontario legislation, and the report that we're providing to the minister is his report, not our report. Uh, and in that respect, it's part of the cabinet uh, process. And uh, it, uh, as we said at the outset, uh, whether it's released and in what form the recommendations uh, see further life is in their hands, not ours. So uh, just to be clear, we're not being we're not being difficult. We uh, we're part of a process. Um, you made one statement that I guess question. Your basic position is that leave any kind of change to local government. Um, we're not suggesting that you leave any kind of change to local government. Obviously, that you were put together to implement some change. What we're suggesting is that if there is change, it's based on some frameworks or key principles that local governments can then work together to implement. I think that covers it. Thank you very much. That brings us to the conclusion of our morning uh, list of delegations. Uh, we have another delegation registered to speak to us at 1 o'clock, so we're going to recess until then and uh, welcome you to come back uh, for the balance of the, pro of the uh, presentations if you're available. Thank you.
introductory statements other than to say I'm Michael Fenn and this is Ken Sealing. We are the special advisors to Minister Steve Clark on the Regional Government Review. We have uh, a number of delegations registered this afternoon and uh, the format is that if you represent an individual, if you're an individual, we give you five minutes. If you represent an organization, you will receive 10 and we may post questions to you uh, after you are submission. And when we post questions, you shouldn't interpret that as being our preliminary thinking or where we're going. We're just trying to probe people and challenge them on some of their ideas. So um, play along with us. Um, the first registered speaker is Gordon Brennan. Mr. Brennan, are you in attendance? If you'd come forward, introduce yourself to the audience and begin your presentation, please. Brennan, uh, resident of Oakville since 1994. Um, please forgive me, I I was um, up all night uh, with this stupid tooth fine. I was, Dentist is a great dentist, but she, uh, she's not taking my emails right now to fix this too. But anyways, that's another thing altogether. Okay. Um, so, my name is Gordon Brennan. I've lived, worked, and played in my chosen hometown of Oakville since 1994. For 25 years, my wife and I have been loyal property taxpayers towards Oakville's treasury with the normal expectations that all citizens hope for from their elected officials at Town Hall. I'm generally not a political man, despite the fact that I was a mayoral and Ward 4 councillor candidate in the last two elections. I never wished to become, or ever had been, a politician, and no disrespect intended. I stand before you today to state my 750 words in my allocated five minutes, because I appreciate that you have brought forward a great task at hand a review of our current municipal government. So in turn, I would like to ask this question. What are the eight characteristics of good governance? My answer is, it is participatory, consensus-oriented, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, and follows the rule of law. In the past five years, I have attended numerous council, uh, cha council chamber meetings and viewed many more of the town's live feed. I witnessed participation with hundreds of residents, but also witnessed Mayor Burton being dismissive and argumentative with citizens, with citizens who have any type of grievance with him on issues that affect their families. In terms of consensus-oriented, watching Mayor Burton shut down Councillor Adams in Councillor Chambers when he motioned to form a committee to discover the ins and outs of why it was costing $34 million a year on the Astry program was, in my review, quite revealing. The two most important terms, accountability and transparency, have been the largest problem with our current administration. In November 2007, Council passed a resolution to no longer have an outside independent third party auditor general. Scrutiny on spending was eliminated. Charging hundreds and even thousands of dollars for MFOI reports, then if paid by residents, documents are redacted for information that should be in the public domain for free. Voting to opt out of uh, cannabis retail stores, but withholding the fact that Oakville had, has the huge distribution warehouse for the entire province within its border. Then claiming they knew nothing about it until December of 2018, despite the fact that the building permit was issued in July of 2018. Promises made, but still not realized. In 2014 and 2018, Mayor Burton and many councillors committed to removing fluoride from our drinking water, synchronizing our local traffic lights, saving Sawweed Golf Course from development, and council made an in-camera secret deal with Carlo, Carlo Baldessero Green Park Homes, Oakville Transit buses from polluting uh, diesel to clean electric, controlling growth, and basically approving 10,000 new units on stream right now, electoral reform, or ranked ballots, canceling that outright. The uh, Smart Cities grant was abandoned, canceled meeting with Premier Ford on autonomous transit, uh, on autonomous transit due to union backlash. Internet voting canceled, albeit Bur Burlington voted online. Oakville Transit bus ads disallowed in 2014, then approved for use in 2018. Far 
Farms to remain as farmland. Almost all local farms have been developed or are being developed. In terms of responsive, we need to ask longtime owner, homeowner Mary Kenner on Grange Road what kind of response she received from our town politicians concerning her broken and caved in ancient culvert. She was told that she was 100% responsible to repair everything on her own expense, despite her inability to afford the unexpected cost. 95% of the culvert was on town land. I helped her as much as I could with a contractor friend who agreed to do the necessary work at cost. On the rule of law provision concerning the ongoing fight against the property owner Club Link and the Glen Abbey Golf Course development proposal, Justice Morgan ruled that the town of Oakville acted in bad faith and ultra vires in its bylaws. I filed two integrity commissioner complaints with the town clerk in 2014 and 2015. I also signed affidavits with my filings. Town council automatically pre-screened my complaints and voted that they would not be read by the then integrity commissioner, Robert Swayze. Justice Bellamy in her rulings concerning the Toronto computer leasing inquiry stated that members of the public should be allowed to make complaints to the integrity commissioner. Complaints can be anonymous and need not be in the form of sworn affidavit. To preserve the necessary independence of the office of the integrity commissioner, no elected official should pre-filter complaints to that office. If I may, I would Brandon, conclude getting with... to the end of your time. Okay. So, am I allowed to make uh, my sure conclusion? wrap up? But, okay, uh, yeah, this is my concluding paragraph. If I may, I would conclude with recommending that a full general audit by an independent third party be undertaken immediately with particular focus on the operating expenses and the capital expenditures of Oakville. Additionally, it may be prudent to investigate enacting the limitation of councillors' terms of office to stimulate new and innovative ideas for our ever-changing world. Finally, I believe strongly in nonpartisan activities, especially within municipal governments, and the AMO appears to agree with that sentiment. Therefore, I would humbly recommend that an inquiry be made into the mayor's office in terms of his official partisan activities, official partisan activities within his terms of office of 2006. And I also would like to say that um, concerning our transit buses, um, I would love to see them privatized. We lose $20 million a year on our transit buses every year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? I don't, apparently no questions, so thank you very much. Thank you. Our next registered speaker is John Taylor. Mr. Taylor. If you would introduce yourself to the audience, for those who don't know you, and uh, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Taylor. I'm six months retired councillor. Uh, having served 30 years at the city of Burlington and 21 years in this council chamber. Uh, first of all, I'd like to offer an apology to uh, our hosts. Uh, I just on late Wednesday saw the regional staff reports that are going to committee next week uh, on the provincial budget effects on finances at, at the region and service delivery issues. So I've now taken a deeper dive uh, and I would have, like to say that the, uh, uh, what I submitted to get this delegation was at an extremely low level and not dealing with the reality of the budget. So uh, my first point is that I believe we all benefit by being part of the Great Golden Horseshoe. It is probably the most important economic development project in, in Canada. But it has its problems. Uh, the, uh, it is a, almost a world path growth center, but it's really a province within a province and in actually six provinces within a province. If you take Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and the four Atlantic provinces. But the governance system, which is what your mandate is, relies 
on a 150-year-old premise of the role of municipalities in public life. Also, it relies on a financial structure that does not reflect the realities of living in a modern world. So in today's tension-filled, techn technologically advanced world, uh, municipalities can no longer pro prosper as children of the province. Relying on 8% of total tax dollars plus uh, gifts, as I call it, or so-called permanent funding from the federal and provincial governments and the occasional politically motivated financial gifts to municipalities at election time. So the solution to that problem is that we need to look at making municipalities a third order of government with much more independence and a bigger share of the tax dollars to deal with modern issues, transportation, social housing, climate change, growth management, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. The second point I'd like to talk about is transportation in the uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe. This is a big problem and it's growing. It affects the quality of life of everyone living in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. It affects the productivity of businesses. So, but do we have a plan for transportation? No, not a long-term plan. We have now a 22-year growth plan but we don't have a transportation plan to accommodate the growth. We also, I believe, do not have the organization that we need to meet the growth targets and to deal with the transportation issues. Uh, 20 years ago, when I think this last was looked at, when the Anne Golden review of uh, the greater Toronto area I suggested at that time that we look at the Greater Vancouver Regional District where municipalities have the money and have the power to deal with transit. It needs to be looked at again. Right now, we could also, uh, and I've, I've checked this out with the Regional Treasurer, the DCs for Go Transit, which are, I guess, eventually end up in, with Metrolinx, are only indexed. They've never been reviewed against a financial plan. Oh, I guess there was one law for the province and another law for municipalities. That needs to be looked at. Otherwise, we are not going to be successful as a organization. I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The other idea that I would like to put forward to you is to deal with the transportation problem, not only do the new people have to contribute through proper development charges, but us existing residents need to pay for that too. And it shouldn't be based on the property tax. It should be dedicated money collected on the income tax that will go to expanding the transit and transportation system in an organized, logical way from the center out. The third point I'd like to make is growth management. Halton is expected to, to double its population over the next 22 years. When you sit down with a calculator and work on that, that is a 3.25% compounded annual growth rate. I've never seen a growth rate like that. Halton, 3.25%. That's 7,500 housing units. Or to put it another way amid the controversy over uh, uh, intensification, it's 35, 20 story apartment buildings 
starting this year and growing to 70 20 star apartment buildings by 2041. That's what 3.25% compounded growth means. It's not going to happen. So we need to settle on a more reasonable rate of growth. We need infrastructure growth financing. There's no, our experience in Halton is that the schools, the hospitals, the provincial infrastructure needed to support growth is falling too far behind. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. There may be a couple questions. So in terms of transportation planning, you sort of jump between, so you're talking about the G, the greater Golden Horseshoe, but what's your view on transportation planning within the region of Halton? Or did I, I'm just oh, trying to sort out what uh, you're getting uh, at there. In, in, in the short term, uh, I believe the, the region uh, should take over responsibility for transportation. I know some of my former colleagues disagree with me on that, but I think it makes logical sense as a step towards a greater golden horse transportation authority that will come with time. All you have to do is the boundaries that we seek to protect now will be irrelevant in 40 years from now. All you have I, 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 I've told my colleagues that the, the particular the city of Burlington, when we were talking about intensification and growth, he says, "All you, if, if you look at the city of Toronto now, it's only a hundred years from the horse and buggy. Watch Murdoch mysteries, and you will you will see the difference. And this that's based on actual historical buildings and pictures. Growth is is, is going to come." But we need to organize it way better and put it on a reasonable financial basis. So just going to go back to my original question, then. Do you see transit both planning and operational at a regional level? Yes. Okay. I wasn't clear on your point about the growth rate, the 3.25% compound at annual growth rate. Are you saying that, that we're not planning and building infrastructure with a, uh, fast enough to keep pace with that, or are you suggesting that that rate is too high to absorb and ought to be deflected somewhere else? I, I think it is too too fast. I don't think even Burlington, at the height of its growth, grew at 3.25%. And that was on a smaller base. I'm saying with the base that we have now, going from 500,000 people to a million people in 22 years, is a huge number of houses. And, and because of constraints in the two biggest municipalities, Burlington and Oakville, uh, against Greenfield growth, and, and they're, they're a big percentage now. I mean, where are you going to put all these apartment buildings? There's, there's not uh, a taste for it, and there's not, we, we're going to have to slow down the rate of growth. Because I don't think that there's a financial plan because it's so dependent on the province and uh, uh, the federal government for, for funding that on the property tax, we can't afford to pay for the water and wastewater infrastructure. And they apparently can't keep up with the school and the hospitals. Thank you. Let alone affordable housing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Our next registered speaker is uh, Tom Adams. Mr. Adams, if you would introduce yourself to the audience and uh, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Good afternoon, thank you very much. I'm Councillor Tom Adams. Uh, I am the Ward 6 Town Regional Councillor in Oakville. I was previously the Town Councillor for the same area. I was first elected in 2003. I've also been Oakville's budget chair for the, for the last 11 years and was previously the Halton Region Planning Public Works Chair for eight years. So I have a perspective on the functioning of Oakville and Halton, lower tier as well as an upper tier council member. I believe you already have copies of my notes as well as the Moody's report that I've uh, submitted to you. 
Halton Region and each of the lower tier municipalities have passed resolutions endorsing the current effectiveness of our two tier municipal government. It's our view that changes to our structure would be both disruptive and wasteful given how well they're working. Our outcomes have been good from both a financial perspective as well from a community service perspective. Not only do we share a AAA credit rating, but we continue to be ranked as Canada's safest large, uh, large community. To have all of our local municipalities individually ranked high for livability and have satisfaction ratings significantly higher than anyone else. Our community appreciates the importance of local voice and representation being responsible for determining both local service levels as well as planning decisions. Our community appreciates the dynamic differences in each of our local municipalities, despite the regional context in which we operate. And on a few highlighted points, uh, I'd like to say that regionalizing transit or fire in Halton would likely be very expensive, especially for Oakville, uh, given that we pay about 42% of each dollar. I'd also say that our official plans are very well integrated and we do different things at the regional and local level. I also have the Moody's report, which I provided to you, which discusses the provincial review. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about the relevant sections for you, if you'd like, uh, during our questions. I'd like to address Oakville's choice to continue to have both a town councillor as well as a town and regional councillor toward. As you know, Halton Region is one of the fastest growing regions in the country. Uh, as a result, we have a regular discussion about the appropriate amount and type of municipal representation that we have. Um, in 2005, Oakville received a report from a citizen task force that reviewed the ward structure and composition of council. The task force concluded that the two councillor per ward system was appropriate for six reasons. First, it's responsive to the two-tier system in Halton. Second, it allows for partnering of workload. Third, it provides backup during any absence of one ward councillor. Fourth, it permits the opportunity for sober second thought as a result of discussion with one's ward peer. Fifth, it permits greater opportunity for contact with councillors based on time availability of any members. So if one member is not available, the other may be. And sixth, it also allows residents with varying work schedules to run for office based on the varying time demands of a town councillor versus one who is a regional councillor. At that time, Oakville had only six wards and therefore a council of 13. But the task force contemplated that a seventh ward with two additional councillors would be required in North Oakville to accommodate our rapid expansion. Through last term's regional review process, both the region and the local municipalities agreed to amend the composition of our council. This resulted in Oakville having an additional regional seat. This then created the seventh ward in Oakville that the citizen task force had in fact contemplated. The task force understood that the two councillor per ward system was providing both effective and efficient local representation. It was and still is an efficient system. In fact, having recently reviewed our costs, we've noted that Oakville's 15 member council costs less than Burlington's seven member council when salaries, benefits, admin assistance, and office costs are considered. Finally, I appreciate how hard it must be for you to review 82 very different municipalities uh, and to determine which ones need to change and which ones are working well. And I'd like to leave you with the final comment that when things are working as well as they are in Halton and in the local municipalities like Halton Hills, Milton, Burlington, and Oakville, it would be best to leave us alone. Uh, we know how to and we've been able to evolve and change uh, to meet our community needs over time in our own way uh, using our own democratic processes. And so thank you very much for your time today or to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for providing the Moody's report because uh, the uh, as I read the report, I quickly glanced at it and I was yes. trying to trying to relate the section to one of the earlier delegations. Very good. I'll help you with that. Who, well, I can read it myself, and I just wanted to confirm what my read is. Okay. Um, um, the delegation said Moody's has noted amalgamation to put this rating at risk, but the Moody's report just says the review is underway and we'll, we'll we would review any any. Uh, results of the review relative to credit ratings. They're quite two different statements, in my view. Well, the what the statement is in the report is that they'll be monitoring the outcome process and any impact they have on the region's credit. Well, and you'll note that we have a AAA credit rating. So the only way to go is down. And so if there's a review process going on and it's signaled by movies that they're looking at, 
it's a risk to us. It's it can't be good. It can only be bad. Well, they could also be reviewing development charges, other things that, that come out of this thing, not amalgamations necessarily. I think it's a big step to say amalgamation is a thing that triggers the review as opposed to all the other things that might come out of the review. So I just want to make that clear. I don't accept the, the view that amalgamation means downgraded credit rating, as it was suggested in the early delegation, and that's not how I read the, the Moody's report. So anyway, my other question to you is um, <clears throat> one I, I posed a little earlier. I'm going to pose it a little different way since you were the chair of the Finance Committee at the, at the area municipality. And so when you, what both bodies are legitimate forms of government. When you sit at those counties, you have a fiduciary responsibility. So as an as a area councillor, when you come to the regional councillor council, whose fiduciary responsibility is paramount when you come to the regional council, the lower tier or the upper tier where you're sitting? Well, you, you have a double hat situation, of course, when you're both a town councillor and a regional councillor, and you do have to look out for the best interest of the council that you're sitting on time of the decision making. But that being said, when we work on our local budgets in Oakville, we have a view for the overall tax impact to the residents because at the end of the day, there's only one taxpayer. Uh, and so when we have a tax bill in Alton that includes a regional component, a town component, and the education component, for example, and approximately in, in Oakville, it's about 40% region, 40% town, and about 20% education. Our goal has always been for the for more than a decade now to maintain our tax increases at the rate of inflation overall. And so that means that in some cases we'll have years at the region where we are able to uh, keep a, a relatively low impact and that gives space at the local level to do the reinvestment that's required. I know that one of the questions that came up earlier was how come Oakville has a certain tax amount compared to some other place. There's a couple of differences between Oakville and our neighboring municipality. One, the primary one is, in fact, our asset management plan. Uh, we have a fully funded asset management plan. It means that we are uh, rebuilding our road, rebuilding our bridges and our other facilities in our town at the rate of their depreciation. That is unlike virtually any other municipality in Ontario. There are very, very few that are in, in our position. It does mean that we put aside each year additional funds to provide that infrastructure funding. Uh, we also have a stronger transit system uh, in Oakville. It's substantially larger than the other transit systems in Halton. Uh, it's approximately double the size of the one in Burlington, and uh, the Milton one is about a quarter of the size of the Burlington one, approximately speaking. And Halton Hills has, I'll say, a, a budding uh, transit system that's a very specific set of things, as I understand at this point. So there are, there are very big differences in terms of the service levels that we have in those areas. Uh, we also have differences in our fire department. We have a fully professional fire service in Oakville. The other communities in Halton have a mix uh, of uh, full-time professional firefighters uh, supplemented by volunteers. And so uh, in those cases, you have a difference in the costing uh, of those volunteers versus the professional firefighters, the way the, the, those systems work. If you amalgamated those units, uh, you would probably have pressure upwards in terms of the salary and the service levels that are chosen. And it would mean that uh, you would have higher taxes for the operating costs in each of the local municipalities. And Oakville would end up uh, ca uh, carrying the burden of the capital costs required to improve those services, particularly in the transit uh, departments. And so it would be overall a very expensive choice uh, to regionalize and amalgamate those units. My question was more specifically to fiduciary responsibility between the two tiers. And having sat on a regional council for 40 years, there were often debates as to whether a particular cost should be ascribed to the area municipality or to the region. And so when you come to the regional council as an area councillor, where is, where is your primacy there? Who, whose fiduciary trust are you looking after, the lower tiers or the upper tiers? Which hat do you wear? Maybe I can a ask a construction project. Maybe I can ask that question just on that construction point. You chaired Public Works, uh, I believe, when you're trying to put together a, a strategy for inf uh, trunk infrastructure for the whole region. Yes. Did you, as chair, find yourself trying to reconcile essentially parochial interests against the broader regional interest? I'd say very rarely uh, would we have those kind of issues. There were a very small number of cases where there might be disruption to a very localized water system, for example, where uh, the, the local regional councillor for that area, uh, he, he or she would have much more detailed information about the particulars of that case, where there might be 50 or 100 residents who might be disrupted because of a particular thing that's going on. Um, and that local view would be useful to us. But I would say that that was 
an issue of uh, who's who's in, who's the boss. That was that was really a question of do you have good representation in the local uh, area there. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Moody's report. I'm sorry? Thank you for bringing the Moody's report. I I'm, I'm glad that it's of service. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we should probably make the point that, uh, as Moody's does, that this review may have an impact on um, the delivery of municipal services and the credit ratings of municipalities. I think it's fair to say uh, our approach would be what would be uh, beneficial for the taxpayers of these regions. And so uh, in that context, I think Moody's references to impact, uh, impacts can be positive or negative, and we're very conscious of that. We are very happy to hear that you're conscious of that. Um, as I said, uh, it's a risk to us, and uh, because of our AAA rating, uh, any change is likely to increase by several basis points. Uh, the cost. Uh, you didn't play. listen carefully enough to what I said. Uh, the the point I was making is uh, Halton, along with a number of regions, which have been historically quite dependent on development charges and have some major infrastructure rebuilding challenges ahead of them, as do the local or the lower tier municipalities within the region, need to uh, give some thought to how they're going to finance these things. And uh, there are a variety of ways in which that might be undertaken. So it doesn't presuppose the existing arrangements. That's my point. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, our next uh, registered speaker is Blair, R. Blair Smith and Lynn Crosby, representing the We Love Burlington Citizens Advocacy Group. Would you, um, oh, there. <coughs> I'm Blair Smith, and I'd like to uh, introduce my colleagues, Lynn Crosby and Joseph Bagstaff. We represent the We Love Burlington Advocacy Group. We are distinctly grassroots and nonpartisan and we advocate on a broad range of issues that affect the city of Burlington and its citizens. We mobilized as a very small action group about six weeks ago around regional government review with a primary mission of raising public awareness that the review existed and what its implications could be. We recognize that the regional government review's aim is to find efficiencies for the municipalities involved to improve services and to address governance issues if they're found to exist, and we support those objectives generally. However, we oppose any suggestion of amalgamation of the city of Burlington into a broader Halton region organizational structure because we believe, as reported in the 2015 Fraser Institute report, that such actions are seldom fiscally prudent or operationally effective. Um, as such, we're concerned with a potential loss of direct access to local decision makers and a loss of sensitivity to local need. Loss of Burlington's distinct, long, and extremely proud heritage. Increased bureaucracy and increased government, although potentially fewer politicians, and that's good. Um, reduced or lost services and higher costs, resulting in a higher tax burden and larger municipal debt. At present, Burlington has the highest ratio of councillors, citizens of any municipality in the region, and we believe in the province. Um, approximately one to over 30,000 per ward councillors, and one to over 26,000 per council as a whole. We believe that we have an efficient governance structure, which also has the requisite sensitivity to local issues not possible in a larger, less directly accountable, and more distant governance model. We understand that similar concerns have been put forward in detail by other delegations and in other jurisdictions. However, we'd like to offer some additional cautions arising from challenges in the recent provincial budget and other initiatives which have been implemented since the announcement of the review last January. In particular, the context of local municipal program delivery has changed dramatically in the last few months as a result of opening of private cannabis stores, which are now the subject of municipal regulation and enforcement, reductions in funding transfers and support to public health entities and the potential for further consolidation of such services, reductions in transfers and support for childcare, legal aid, and a number of other social assistance programs, elimination of the LINs and CCACs with unclear catchment areas or successor organizations, which we believe at the very least creates uncertainty and confusion around 
any local responsibilities for health care delivery. The proposed availability of wine and beer in corner stores, which will create an additional regulatory burden on municipalities and, as in the case of cannabis, will require a local focus in such areas as proximity to school. Proposed changes to planning approvals through Bill 108, which appear to suggest a return to the substance, if not indeed the fact, of the OMB model creating further uncertainty for local and regional planning directions. Potential changes to the Development Charges Act, again through Bill 108, that would download a number of additional costs to municipalities, and proposed changes to the Conservation Authorities Act, the Endangered Species Act, and 11 other pieces of legislation, all with downstream, but as yet unclear, impacts on municipalities. In light of these considerations, we would submit that a better immediate focus for your review would be a who does what exercise prior to any consideration regarding governance or the redistribution of program delivery responsibilities. In particular, such a review would provide valuable insight into the optimal organization of service delivery at the local level in what has become an extremely dynamic policy context. It should also include an analysis of the net impact to taxpayers when all of the above initiatives are fully implemented. Indeed, how can we identify the overall cost or benefit of anything coming from the review when the impact of provincial downloading to the municipalities is still unknown? We're not saying that benefits won't be derived. In fact, we believe that they will. But what will be the net result? In addition, there are processes and process improvements to the existing environment that could be mandated by the review such things as a commitment to a defined exercise of self-analysis by the municipalities in the region, or common targets for further efficiencies in the current structure, an obligatory process of continued improvement. There are also possible specific efficiency opportunities within the existing governance model. For example, consider optimizing or rebalancing procurement responsibilities. Could the region execute contracts and procurement deals with broader scope of application and therefore greater potential savings? Are regional vendors of record a viable option? Are provincial uh, vendors of record available to the region? We believe that they should be, with even greater potential scope for application and savings. Is regional fleet management a possibility since historically discrete organizations have a tendency to overbuy and underutilize. Are the information technology platforms common across the region and truly interoperable? Is full advantage being taken of a common data resource catalog across all municipalities? Is open government, as it's called, a reality enabling an informed and committed citizenry within the governance structure we firmly believe that an empowered citizen is the single best and most critical element of any governance structure that you could possibly devise. We believe that before significant change is made to our existing governance and service delivery environment, available but non-disruptive improvements should be made first. Our overriding concern is that there is a limited capacity for the quantum of change to municipalities that's anticipated over the coming month, and the system is in danger of being overloaded. Large business transformation and restructuring projects often fail not because they're ill-conceived, but because too many projects at once, no matter how worthwhile, result in overloading what is essentially a closed system. Each project is critical on its own merits, but the final tally of impact can be devastating. Cultural and organizational change may be inevitable, but it's not inherently open-ended. We believe that it's prudent that you as the reviewers help the government take the, the time to understand the complexity of the various organizational, governance, and service delivery models that are being reviewed. We also believe that it's equally critical for you to identify where the true problems lie and the distinctive and varied nature of the opportunities for improvement and we support recent announcements that suggest that distinct and varied solutions are in fact being sought, that there is no cookie cutter approach contemplated. 
We understand that change is both necessary and positive as long as it's thoughtfully done with better service to the citizen and better stewardship of public resources as the goal. However, even necessary change is imposed without a solid, well understood environment for service delivery and decision making can lead to system wide confusion, if not failure. We know that you're searching for good ideas, but even the best ideas can be injurious to a system that overtaxed with unclear outcomes and dwindling on certain resources. Today, we think that there are simply too many undecided elements in the policy and funding framework, excuse me, that municipalities have been handed by the province. We welcome examination of services that could possibly be more effectively planned, funded, coordinated, or delivered at the regional rather than city or town level that would benefit through broadening the scope of operation. However, we've not conducted a detailed analysis and we will not offer candidates carelessly. We are opposed to any direction that would further distance the citizens of Burlington from those whom they elected, although we may not always agree with decisions of our chosen officials. We support the decision-making process and would argue that the citizen's voice is now both heard and respected in Burlington and in Halton generally. In closing, we understand the objectives of the review and we support them. We believe that Halton Region is well run with a governance model that works and a service delivery model that is continually reviewed with necessary improvements and, and adjustments being made. It has even been referenced by one of our provincial representatives as a poster child for regional excellence. We're concerned, however, that the review may impose change on a structure that has already experienced multiple shocks and can no longer absorb their impact. We caution that we proceed slowly with a view to the cumulative financial and operational impacts of recent provincial policy directions. Finally, we firmly believe that the citizens of the affected community should have a decisive and a deciding voice in any proposed changes. We understand that the review and its consequences are entirely within the powers and the prerogatives of the provincial government and we don't challenge that. But not one individual for, voted for them a year ago when they were unannounced and perhaps not even contemplated. Thank you. Do your colleagues want to make a comment uh, at this point? Okay, then we uh, have some questions, I believe. Um, just uh, one, you made a comment. Maybe through, maybe the reference was the beginning of the speech. Have, have, you've absorbed multiple shocks, and was that a reference to the other cutbacks? Or is that what you're referring it's, it's to? It's a reference to the changes that have been imposed through the provincial budget and recent provincial policy directions. I have one sort of, it might sound a little bit philosophical, but um, I, I think one of the approaches we're taking to our task is uh, that a number of the changes that you've enumerated are coming this way, whether you choose to uh, welcome them or not, and uh, they would have uh, fiscal impacts, likely, and those are things that are to be debated in other forums. Our job is, uh, as was said in the outs at the outset, to look at decision making, to look at representation, and to look at service delivery models. And uh, I guess essentially to uh, give advice on how to how municipal governments can position themselves to deal with what they're going to have to deal with. It's that kind of uh, point of entry into the conversation. So one of the things I was uh, interested in hearing you, uh, and, and you've given us a, quite a useful list, I'll say, of, of uh, ways in which system improvements might be looked at. So I think uh, that's, uh, that's much appreciated. Um, the question I have really is, uh, we've heard a, a lot of back and forth about the representation and decision-making role of councils, uh, and uh, not, not as much on service delivery as perhaps we would have hoped to have, but a lot on that topic. And you highlighted the fact that the Burlington Council, which I think is seven, um, seems to operate to your uh, satisfaction. We hear uh, two... We, we frequently hear the case being made for a lot of representation, a lot of access, a lot of uh, involvement of citizens as council members, that kind of thing. Uh, of course, that's, that's a two-way dynamic. Uh, there, there are uh, 
arguments to be made for efficiency of decision making by not having big councils and not, not having a lot of political interplay there. And um, as you point out, Burlington is an example of one that is a relatively compact council relative to others. So I guess my uh, well, my question to you and one of the questions we're going to have to address is on the one hand you want efficient decision making but on the other hand you want representation and uh, one if you sacrifice one for the other you aren't going to be happy with the results. So I'm interested in whether any of the three of you had a thought about the, uh, the current size of Burlington's council and whether that's a formula that should be applied elsewhere. I think that the current size is is working effectively. I think access to ward councillors um, is is generally very good. Uh, they are responsive. Uh, I think that um, they have shown that they have the time and the ability to assimilate the issues and to respond to them effectively. Um, I think that it's it's probably within. Um, perhaps not optimum, but it, it, it's uh, an efficient structure. Yeah, and uh, I guess I'd ask the Corall Corall we question, which is, if that's true of Burlington, what would be the appropriate formula for Halton? Should that council have separate, uh, separate elections to count Halton Council? Should Halton Council be as large as it is? Uh, what's the implication, what, what inference should you draw from Burlington in terms of the regional decision-making forum? Well, I think different contexts, uh, different tiers. I think that the mix right now is probably working extremely well. I think the governance structure has been quite effective. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say that there are tweaks, but that uh, right now I think the governance structure works. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registered uh, delegation is uh, Teresa Sarkeesian, who represents the Electricity Distributors Association. Ms. Sarkeesian, are you here? And uh, you have a colleague, if you could both introduce yourselves and... Uh, Absolutely. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fenn and Mr. Sealing. I want to thank you for allowing us to make a deputation today uh, before your esteemed committee. My name is Teresa Sarkeesian. I'm president and CEO of the Electricity Distributors Association. Uh, today, uh, the chair of my board, Mr. Jerry Smallgange, who's also president and CEO of Burlington Hydro, will be making the remarks, but both of us will be available for questions. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerry, and thank you for that, Teresa. And um, like she explained, I actually live in Burlington. I, uh, currently the CEO of Burlington Hydro. I'm joined, uh, um, you know, it's very nice of uh, Teresa to um, allow me to make the remarks, so I appreciate that. Um, as an introduction to the EDA itself, uh, we are the voice of Ontario's uh, local uh, hydro industry, which consists mostly of municipally and privately owned local distribution companies, which we uh, refer to affectionately as LDCs. We deliver electricity to all of Ontario's 5 million residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional customers. We contribute close to $400 million to dividends annually to our municipal and uh, provincial uh, partners. And there's approximately 100 uh, Ontario municipalities who own share in LDCs. So although Ontario is uh, presently served by approximately 60 LDCs, this is far fewer than was the case uh, in the 1990s when there was over uh, 300 public utility commissions. And uh, the there is actually uh, a link that I'm going to make back to the old public utility commissions in uh, these remarks. So then uh, government initiated uh, restructuring of our sector um, into uh, incorporated businesses, which you're well familiar with, along municipal amalgamations, produced the LDCs to fewer than 100, LD, 100 at the time. And since that time, shareholder business decisions on various mergers and acquisitions have further reduced it to approximately 60. As the review considers issues that may potentially lead to outcomes that could include new municipal nations, um, we uh, at the EDA encourage uh, the panel to be mindful of the unintended consequences of uh, such recommendations on uh, local distribution of hydro. And um, I'll just leave it at that. The EDA has held a long-held position 
that any further incentives or direction from the government for increased LBC consolidation must respect local decision making and maintain the commitment to being voluntary and commercially viable in the best interests of shareholders, customers, and LBC itself. And the consequences uh, are obvious. Uh, right now, the power is out in Alton Hills, so 3,800 homes. And um, so you just got to reflect on the decisions uh, that are made. So we note that the, the panel, um, the review, could affect 24 local hydro utilities located within the regions. Um, our wider uh, comments today are focused on the review's key theme of improving the quality of municipal services and reducing costs less on, on governance. So as we look to an industry, um, we're looking at ways to reduce further costs for all customers, and we're here to support the panel, recommending that the government consider the greater potential uh, for enabling multi-utility services where appropriate, and that's the reference that I made to the PUC model. What we mean by uh, multi-utility services are opportunities for electricity utilities to further expand their scope into areas of water and wastewater activities across Ontario, and I'll give you examples later on. This could mean operation and management water utilities, some of our municipalities do that, or it could it could creep into asset ownership. And a good example, like currently we do work with the region. There is actually a good partnership there that for uh, municipally owned hydros do water billing for the, the region of Halton. But you could extend, expand that. Right now the region is looking at uh, meter and metering infrastructure. The electricity companies already have that infrastructure. We could partner in that area. And, and you could you could actually extend that model to actually looking at a customer perspective. And uh, a lot of the development that's going to be going forward is more in the form of vertical subdivisions or large buildings where the hydros actually could own both or install the water and the electricity assets. So customers could benefit from a multi-utility uh, provider's ability to mitigate costs through the um, elimination of duplicate administrative or actually operational um, utility services. So based on historical experience, the EDA's analysis is that the expansion of scope of the LDC is to operate and manage wastewater and uh, water services could account for up to a 7% savings on uh, a, I guess, consolidated basis between electricity and water distribution costs. It's not immaterial. So again, this could range from, I'm not saying we need to get into the um, water treatment or wastewater business. I guess what I'm specifically referring to is the actual servicing of new development. There could be a partnership model that uh, exists there and, and can be looked at. So in fact, uh, LDCs have already expanded into water utility operations and, and the, there's a number of uh, regions that you've probably been to that have uh, made those comments. So as, as you're aware, the expansion of LDCs into providing greater operation and management of water utilities has not traditionally been a province-wide model, particularly in the regions now under review, although prior to that review it was. Most LDCs activities in water still specifically to uh, billing services as a, as a legacy uh, function of their pre-1999 um, restructuring from PUCs and moving to uh, independent corporations. A few examples, though, uh, Kingston Utilities does combine water, wastewater, gas, and electrical services, and so their broadband uh, fiber optics company under the leadership of a single CEO. The structure has ensured uh, considerable strong cost savings through economies of scope, while also making sure that infrastructure repairs are less disruptive, it's all happening at the same time to residents and businesses. Utilities Kingston benefits from a shared services model for activities, equipment, systems, customer care, billing, accounting, fleet, and even some operational functions. Another example is Enwin, which is um, in Windsor. They operate and maintain the electricity utility, as well as the water production and distribution systems and the district energy and heat and cooling within the community. It's a little bit of a unique structure, um, but has enabled them strategic alignment between the utilities such that has led to efficiencies and savings by eliminating redundancies, consolidating work tasks, and reducing considerably headcount. The outcome has been a high-functioning, results-oriented, sustainable operation that has seen reduction costs and increases in innovation. A smaller example in power, in Innisfil has recently adopted a new business, business model with their shareholders affiliate to bring about 
greater efficiencies to residents and business owners in their community. So InPower provides water and wastewater services, including billing, human resources, financial, and payroll support. That offers, again, reduced administrative uh, services and ultimately savings for customers. The utility is committed to exploring all other shared services options, uh, in order to benefit customers in the long run. So these are just a few examples already successfully working as a model uh, elsewhere in Ontario that could be considered by this panel as it deliberates on its report to the government. The EDA recommends that the regional government review encourage the government to use the successful LDC experience. It's now been 20 years almost as a model and consider allowing more electricity utilities to operate and maintain water utility assets more broadly and to find natural efficiency to mitigate future cost increases for both water and electricity. To conclude, I wish to thank the panel again for the opportunity to participate today on behalf of our industry. And Ontario's LDC has a long history of working with our municipal shareholders and communities to the benefit of our customers. And the regional government review should be recommended to the government uh, to consider all opportunities for efficiencies for all regions and consider effective multi-utility services where appropriate. The EDA and Ontario's LDCs would welcome the opportunity to engage further uh, with yourselves and the government on this potential in greater detail where appropriate at your request. Thank you, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Sir Casey, do you have um, any additional comments? Uh, no, I don't. Well, if you all both stay there, there may be some questions or comments. Like we said, we're going to be devil's advocate for a little bit and ask some questions. So, um, back in the uh, in the 70s and the 80s, when the regions were created, and uh, the province had a, actually a specific uh, in, intent of doing away with special purpose bodies to bring accountability and services directly to elected account, accountable bodies. And so they were lodged uh, by and large, uh, ultimately with the with the regions or single tier municipalities. So I was. Uh, I was a hydro commissioner for nine for seven years while I was a mayor. We had monthly public meetings. They were advertised in the paper. People would come to the meetings. Uh, people knew who their hydro commissioners were. Uh, some were elected, some were appointed. And then uh, during the uh, the push of the Harris years to try and create private utilities, the, the commissions were privatized. So the hydro commissions in my community have one open meeting a year as their annual meeting. There are two share, three shareholders who vote. Um, there are no other public meetings, no, no direct access to the Hydro Commission. Nobody even knows who, the, who sits on those boards. And um, so my, my point I guess I'm trying to make is, how do we maintain accountability for our major services if in fact they get hived off to private sector boards who aren't elected, who aren't accountable, who hold no public meetings, they're selling themselves off uh, the public doesn't even know what's going on most of the time. They're amalgamating, doing all sorts of things. And so you're, you're recommending expanding that model into other public services. So maybe dissuade me that it's <laughs> not the way to go. Okay. All right. Um, uh, thank you. And thank you for your service to the uh, hydro community uh, in, in your past. I was getting nervous when you were talking the 70s and the 80s. I think starting to predate me a little bit. Um, but thank you for your service. Um, I'll make a, a couple of comments about the... Um, so-called privatization. So the majority of the um, utility in Ontario, yes, they are businesses under the Ontario Business Corporations Act as, as the government designated them to be. Uh, but the majority are actually, um, their shareholders are municipalities. There are over 100 municipalities that have a uh, fiduciary interest um, in the utility. And the majority of those do have a number of elected officials on the uh, boards of the utility. I know you expressed some concern about um, the lack of visibility um, in terms of the utility operations. I would say there is actually an even expanded uh, visibility uh, through our regulator, the Ontario Energy Board, uh, where the utility regularly has to appear anytime it makes a change to, to any of its rates. Um, we have rate payers, the gov you know, governments have taxpayer, um, but that's a incredibly intense public process uh, where there's a lot of advertisement uh, in the local community uh, for people to attend in that process. And there's also other processes in place for the utilities when they develop their uh, distribution system plans. Again, they have to do community consultation. And there's more requirements under the Ontario Energy Board that the customers 
um, get uh, surveyed on a regular basis. So there's, I think there's still a lot of involvement uh, in terms of uh, transparency uh, to the community. Um, but my chairman may have additional remarks to make. Yeah, so a little bit on governance. Um, so I'll talk about our own board. So Burlington Hydro has uh, Mayor Ward, uh, Mayor Mead Ward on our board, as well as the CAO from the municipality who are both um, open to questions. I also, the, um, the majority of hydros are run in a fashion where the individual councillors are known to the CEO, and that's the role of the CEO to make sure that there's actually those lines of communication. Uh, the governance itself, the organization, the board members are actually selected based on a skills competition um, by the shareholder. It goes to a public meeting. The, the public can come and comment on who, in fact, Burlington's currently going through the OEB's uh, guidelines right now. They want to see almost a shock absorber between the municipality and, and the hydro itself. So there's the holding companies, not the decision makers. So you get good decisions, what I'm saying, and that uh, there is rotation of those board members. So I, I, I actually would suggest that there's more visibility now than there was when you were a commissioner. There's more um, public consultation. There's more opportunity for the average customer, short of electing someone, to go to the OEB, pull out all the numbers, look at everything. So, so uh, uh, quite frankly, to tell any citizen to go to the Ontario Energy Board and appear there with facts and numbers, I think it's highly uh, in... in It'll never happen, quite frankly. But water rates and sewage rates are set at a council meeting. The public can go and talk, and they're set quite openly uh, at that time. So, at any rate, I just want to raise it that that's, that's a fair a point. We had our open house last night, so we, we were shown, we advertised in the paper our rates, and we said anybody wants to come out and talk about it, and our entire staff was there. So, last night in Burlington. I have a little different direction for my questions. Um, three, really. Uh, first is uh, we're in Halton Region. Uh, utilities um, often function better on a wider footprint than uh, uh, than uh, local municipality. Do you have a view about uh, whether here or elsewhere? Uh, does the EDA have a view about um, having local utilities operated on a regional footing? Um, our longstanding position has been that if uh, utilities are seeking to merge, or with each other, then that should be done on a commercial basis. It should be done on a voluntary basis. Uh, we do believe it's up to the shareholder community um, and the utility to come up with a plan that's in their best interest. So you will see a very, very diverse pattern that's been happening in Ontario. Um, as my chairman spoke, uh, we had over 300 utilities less than 20 years ago. Now we're down to just shop. Um, and it's very random across Ontario. Sometimes it's it's a very perfect match with a lower tier municipality. Sometimes they're, I'd say they're more broader regional utilities, but they don't match up with political regions, if I may. Um, you also have situations where utilities aren't contiguous. They're not shoulder to shoulder. Um, so the way they've expanded when they've done their transactions is they may buy a utility in a different area and leapfrog over for other uh, municipalities, regions. So um, we're kind of agnostic, but we think it needs to be based on a, a voluntary commercial standard. Yeah, th that was my observation, and uh, that's why I asked the question, and I'm not sure I am quite as sanguine about your conclusion, but in any event, go ahead. So the, um, at the end of the day, you're trying to save the customer money, so there is other ways than, than simply merging, at least in our position. We have a um, in Burlington again. Um, there's a cooperative, it's got 14 different uh, municipalities, or sorry, 14 different hydros, 25 different municipalities that do bulk buying. We work together, we do disaster recovery together, we share resources, we do joint IT, do a lot of things together to, to achieve those scale uh, efficiencies that you're looking for. The benefit of still having local autonomous control is you still do have that contact with, like I know all my councillors' names. I know where they all live. I, I can still, I, I and, you know, I still have that relationship with the mayor, who still has that relationship with the constituents. So it, it's worked very well. Uh, other municipalities, maybe, it, you know, they they want to be bigger, but uh, for Burlington, autonomy is important. 
decision making in Burlington is important. Economic development is important. So that's been sort of the way we've done. Thank you. I, I do observe that that's a different attitude than say you'd have about natural gas as a customer and so on. But nonetheless, uh, the other thing you raised though, uh, um, while you're not looking uh, positively at merging in that context, you did say that the merging of utility functions could achieve. 7% uh, savings in some uh, locations. Um, we've, we've heard a lot today about how mergers never work and always cost more money. So I wonder if you could just sort of cast a little light on how, why that might work differently in the utility sector. So we have to be very much on the record here. That is a number that came from when they were combined public utility commissions. Uh, we had um, economic work done. So um, that comes from almost 20 years ago. Uh, on that multi-utility function, uh, simply because uh, not dissimilar to shared services, it's a lot of that back office. Um, and so those are numbers that are, I mean, they're dated, but we're confident that um, you could see a similar um, history repeat itself now. And like we mentioned, we do have some members that are already engaging in that, and they're all saying that the, their savings are that much or higher currently. Well, and as you referenced earlier, there's a big technological investment in front of utilities generally, and that presumably has some synergies if it's worked together. But, uh. So just one other comment on the on the model. So, so if LDC took over some of the utilities, currently the, um, uh, well, the province of Ontario for some years has tried to get true cost accounting for sewer, for water costs and sewage costs and try to get in there. But under the, under the LDC model, uh, your shareholders skim off money off the top to go to their general funds and other, other activities, uh, where under the old system, any surplus went back into the system. Now the shareholders are taking up a, a, a div I get dividend, is that the name that's used now as a dividend? And it's, so uh, in this model that you're proposing, you're suggesting, uh, would people then be paying sewer and water bills without knowing that they're paying for arenas and parks and other things? So I'll give you an example. So there's a, a big building going downtown right now. It's called uh, Bridgewater. So Burlington Hydro and the region both stop at the door and there's water services and there's electricity services. But it's gonna cost about $300,000 to service that building with water meters. And it's gonna cost about another $300,000 to service it with electrical meters. So that every individual condo has the opportunity to manage their own consumption. So this is where I'm getting as an opportunity for synergy. Instead of having two systems within the building, you have one. And one system communicates for both. And if there's opportunity to work together or even to jointly own those assets, that's sort of the model I'm talking about. The services to an actual house, like it, traditionally the way it works, Burlington Hydro would come in and serve them. Then we'd leave. And well, actually, it goes the other way around. The region would come in and service the home with water. And then once they've left, we would come in and service the, re the house with electricity. There's inherent inefficiencies in doing it that way. If you did it all at once, you would see. So again, I'm not seeing we transfer water treatment, wastewater treatment on mass to municipalities unless you saw some benefit to that. I'm talking about expansion of the system, working together in a cooperative model. And you don't actually have to uh, take profit if you don't want to on the water assets. I'm just talking about the operational safety. So I'm just questioning whether we're setting the stage for hidden taxation. Well, interestingly enough, though, the water is funded on its own. So that's why you're seeing 10% increases on water. I, I see it because we get the complaints. We get the complaints coming into customer services. We do the billing for water. And they're complaining, why has it gone up so much? And that's because there isn't the opportunity to take a loan and amortize over so many years the infrastructure that's got to go into the ground. You have to do it within basically, you know, the actual project. You can't, you know, in debt um, a massive amount of the system. Whereas when you moved um, to the electrical utilities, you can. You can take uh, large long-term debentures and, and loans. So there is some advantages to both models. I'm not saying that. I'm just more talking about the cooperative aspect of working at the same time instead of going in twice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned a number of things uh, in your presentation that you sort of blew by that we're interested in. So if you could leave a copy of the presentation or send it to us later on yeah. in some form, uh, that would be appreciated. Okay. Thank, you. That. Thank you. Thank you for your time. That. Thank you for your time.
Our next uh, registered speaker is Stan Smyer. Smyr. Is he here? And apparently he has not appeared, so uh, we will move him to the last of the list. Um, the next uh, registered speaker is George Niblock from the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association. Mr. Niblock, are you available? If you would introduce yourself to the audience and begin your presentation, we'll give you 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I'm George Niblock. Uh, I'm the president of the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association, and uh, we're a, a member of the We Love Oakville campaign. The last presenter for We Love Oakville today. Oakville uh, Lakeside Residents Association is the oldest uh, RA formed uh, in Oakville in the 1960s. We enjoy great uh, representation and relationship with our local and regional councillors. Uh, they're available to us, uh, you know, at, at a phone call, uh, and we're able to arrange meetings with them on local issues uh, regularly. We had them out this morning on an issue where we're uh, working to rejuvenate Town Square. They're attending our uh, local AGM next week, so they get to meet and take questions from all our residents. For Oakville and Halton, our two-tier official plan is uh, one plan in two parts. It's an excellent structure where the regional part is the high level, which implements the provincial policy directives. And the local municipal part, which allows for local taste and preference. These two parts complement and don't contradict. We feel the two-tier government is the optimal solution for Halton Region. On transit, there's been transit discussions here today, and I think our feeling is that if there are perceived problems, um, then a comprehensive needs assessment should take place. Um, we do cooperation with uh, our neighboring uh, municipalities. We run buses into Burlington, we run buses into Mississauga. Um, but transit is a very expensive endeavor. And uh, I think one solution doesn't necessarily fit all of Halton. I mean, integration to Mississauga is just as important, if not more, than perhaps Mississauga or Milton or Halton Hills. The other big challenge on transit, uh, any kind of transit integration, is the population density disparity between the local municipalities. Uh, very low in Milton and Halton Hills compared to Oakville and Burlington. Oakville has also invested heavily in transportation um, to the tune of about $100 million dollars a year, 100 buses, uh, which is double Burlington and far, far more than the other local municipalities. We very much appreciate your endorsement of uh, very careful planning for implementation of any changes. We absolutely agree with that sentiment. Um, I think the big question for us in this review is, do we have a barrier to getting changes made to improve service, uh, service delivery and efficiencies in our current two-tier structure? And we believe the answer to that is, in fact, no. We don't have a barrier. And uh, at this point, we, we would like uh, to offer, if you have any further questions or there's any more information that we, uh, in we Love Oakville can provide, we are very much happy to work with you and provide anything uh, down the road. And thank you for your time and allowing our input, especially on a beautiful Friday long weekend. Well, we promise you we'll uh, get you off onto the weekend uh, very soon. Um, I have one question. Uh, and I'd just like to understand a little bit about the point you made about the, uh, the catchment area or the patterns of use of the transit system in, in Oakville, because I think it may speak to a broader question. Um, if I 
uh, took that correctly, you said that it, it's at least as important, maybe more important, to maintain good connections with Mississauga, and that most of the pattern of, of uh, transportation interaction is, it tends to be east-west rather than north-south. Has that been the experience of, of Oakville as a community? I believe so. I'm, I'm certainly no transit uh, expert, but I mean, this to me, this leads back to, uh, you know, I think of any changes that are to be proposed that a real study, an in-depth study has to be done of that to figure out exactly what the needs are and whether there are any uh, potential benefits um, to changes. Um, certainly in Oakville, uh, you know, I know they, they doubled at some point the number of buses uh, from 50 to 100, but ridership only went up by 25 percent. So it, it wasn't a great uh, investment in that respect. Um, you know, and there was some discussion earlier about um, access to uh, GO trains, which is really important. Now, Oakville didn't have a problem with that. We got buses running to those GO train stations, but the province built multi-story parking garages at a lot of the stations, which significantly dropped ridership on the transit immediately. Um, so, you know, I think I think study is really critical on this. Oh, that's a um, good observation. Um, good. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. And if you have a copy of it to leave with us, we would uh, we'd appreciate that. But uh, I'll be happy to forward one. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, at uh, 2.17, I think we have reached the end of our list of uh, delegations. The non, the no-show did not show, so uh, uh, we will uh, want to do three things. We want to thank you for spending a, a sunny day with us uh, rather than being outside, and uh, we have found it worthwhile, uh, and I trust you did as well. Uh, we want to thank particularly the delegations that have uh, gone to the trouble and effort and used up their personal time to make a presentation to us. It's, our view is this is important stuff and we need to get the best advice and the best insights that we can in all the 82 municipalities that we're dealing with. There are common threads and there are unique uh, characteristics and uh, we need to decipher those and then uh, work them into our, uh, our uh, presentation. Uh, we are eager to hear from the people who live, work, and spend time in the regions that make up our review. And I think uh, with this as the last of nine public meetings, uh, uh, we are well on our way to do that. But I particularly want to emphasize that it is not too late to make a submission. We have a, a web portal at uh, ontario.ca oblique stroke regional government where you can uh, make a written submission until the close of business on the 21st of May. And if you don't want to uh, go to the trouble of preparing a written submission, we've prepared a questionnaire that teases out a number of issues that uh, we'd welcome your input on. And as I said, we have uh, had several thousand responses so far. We're going through those quite carefully, picking out common themes, uh, differentiating between different uh, geographical areas and all that goes along with that. So we expect that to be a fairly rich mind, to, uh, vein to mind. So uh, I would encourage you to participate in that exercise. So with that, unless my colleague... Uh, Thank has... you all for coming out. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.